All right, welcome everyone to the first FM Disc meeting of 2023. Um, good to see you all here. Hope you all had good holidays. And we are going to jump into our first presentation right away with Vince Manano of Beeswax uh, talking about transactions, new feature added in FileMaker 19.6 with official support. But uh, as Vince will discuss, something that's been in the FileMaker community and it's certainly a topic of discussion for, for many, many years. So uh, Vince, go ahead and the uh, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, nice to see many familiar faces. Uh, uh, and uh, I wish I could be there in person and eventually we'll probably get that going again as well. Um, if at any point during my presentation, you want to ask questions, just stop and ask. I'm not, um, you know, you can just don't have to wait till the very end. So, um, so this is a presentation um, I've prepared and gave in a few different places already, just, just, just before 19.6 uh, came out and then right after 19.6 came out at Big FM, which was last month. And so 19.6 has been out um, just a very short while. And uh, so anyway, I have uh, also <clears throat> a title change in my, my role at Beeswax. I'm, I'm coming up also at Beeswax on 20, almost 20 years, come 2024 next year, will be 20 years at Beeswax. And when I, uh, when I joined Beeswax, uh, we were like five people um, and uh, we were in a residential building in the back of a, like in a kind of an apartment above a garage in a residential area, not too far from ours, Mendy in, in Oakland. And uh, it was, it was an amazing time. Um, I remember overlapping with uh, one person who worked there. His name was Jed uh, and a good friend of Julian. And uh Jed was uh, left a big impression on me when I first joined Beeswax. He was uh, he moved on to do some studies in Buddhism and uh, and uh, religious studies or some such thing. I don't remember exactly what, but he was uh, a fascinating individual. Uh, I would uh, shadow him on meetings. He would go to clients. Anyway, that was my introduction to Beeswax, and and since then uh, a lot has changed. So um, I like hiking, traveling, architecture, precision engineering, sharp knives, and parking backwards. And uh, at this point, I would have pictures of my kids, but I decided to leave those out for now just to shorten the slides. But I have two kids, uh, 14 and, uh, and 10, and uh, they're both wonderful kids. And I've been taking my son out, uh, teaching him how to drive. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> So again, I've been at Beeswax since 2004. I'm the author of Inspector Pro, and uh, at Beeswax uh, we uh, we do. Let's just try to move this out of the way. So okay, so uh, we have uh, over 25 years of experience, and um, we have a lot of clients, a lot of projects, and we're we just last year at the end of last year we're over 100 people now, and I'm amazed because I used to know. Everybody that used to come on and everything, and uh, now people uh, show up, and it's like, uh, wow, you're you're new. I never never saw you. When did you uh, when did you join? So it's it's fascinating to be part of this company and seeing the evolution as it's grown dramatically. Um, we also got our Tableau partnership last year, so we're both uh, FileMaker Claris part, Platinum partners and Tableau partners. And uh, so we do Tableau, FileMaker, web integration, and IT ops work. Uh, there's a lot of you know, interesting blog posts there, so I encourage you to check out the blog at some point. Uh, but we're always looking for, for new people. So if you're ever interested, um, you know, come, come and check us out. Uh, I'll have two of my favorite videos, which I, uh, I'll share the links here or the, the uh, QR code and feel free to, to watch them um, at your leisure. Um, one is a personal favorite, Ted Lasso, Be Curious, Not Judgmental. Uh, the other one is something that uh, I like sharing with new clients that we start work with. And uh, it's a scene from a Phenomenon, a movie with John Travolta. It's a, it's a really cool scene. I love that scene. 
Uh, so the agenda for today's presentation, uh, a quick refresher on transactions, uh, some of the challenges that I think as a community uh, we will be faced with and things to consider. And then some of the benefits that I also see with, uh, with uh, native script transactions as we have them now. And then uh, we'll talk about script transactions. Although uh, there's still some areas of script transactions that I haven't really dug into that was fairly late in, um, in the release of those changes that I, I still haven't found a way to, uh, to understand them and embrace them. So there's a couple of areas there that are missing. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll mention them. Um, and, uh, and then there's a, a, a really cool new addition in 19.6. Um, in we used to have um, BTC milliseconds, uh, but now we have a new one, get current time UTC microseconds, one millionth of a second, one millionth of a second re resolution, millionth of a second resolution. And, um, and this is really cool because uh, I actually uh, did a blog post just on, on this, on this um, new get function. And, uh, you know, a lot of the new machines out there, like the M1s, Apple Silicon machines, it's just so much faster um, that some of these things, if you want to measure in FileMaker milliseconds, you would just get, you wouldn't get uh, a fine enough resolution to understand how fast that uh, particular uh, thing that you're trying to measure. So um, very cool, very cool. I'll do a recap. Okay, so uh, two challenges really uh, that I see are, you know, we're, as we're going to see, we have uh, script transactions, but they're um, they're not user transactions, so they have to be scripted. And so that means that if you wanted to capture uh, a user making changes in, in in a lot of different records in a lot of different places, uh, that, that this, this poses a little bit of a challenge on how to do that. You know, so. Uh, the way we have been doing it and the way we continue doing it is uh, using something called indirect editing. And I'll, and I'll talk about that. Um, so that's, um, so one of the challenges is if you edit the, rec the data um, directly, um, that's, you know, gonna pose some interesting challenges on how you design the scripts to be able to run that transactionally. And uh, so I'll cover that in, in more detail when we get to it. And then, um, the one important fact that you all need to be aware of, which I'm sure many of you are, that uh, FileMaker aggregate functions do not work within the uh, context of uh, the script transaction block for any new or modified data. Uh, once the data is committed, then your FileMaker aggregate functions will work. Um, and so that one poses an interesting challenge for anyone who wants to unhook their unstored, you know, calculations and make them stored. So that one's really, uh, you know, I bring it up mostly for, for, you know, potential discussion, uh, but that's a, that's something to be aware of. And then uh, the two benefits that I see that we can gain from native script transactions is potentially simplification of code and then also performance if you can uh, get to, uh, you know, unhook those unstored calcs transactionally and, and do stuff um, that is uh, stored rather than unstored, uh, you will see definite improvements in performance there. So um, I have other talks I've given in the past uh, on this topic, and um, you can look at those two talks that I gave um, over uh, See, yeah, a couple a year and a half ago or something like that. Okay, so uh, 19.6, they had also an announcement that Rick posted. I uh, have a, some uh, uh, a QR code for that. And then the blog post that, um, that I was talking about in terms of uh, UTC microseconds. That's actually a typo there. <clears throat> okay, so uh, in the examples that I'm going to um, to be talking about for uh, for this a, a really really simple uh, structure basically one to many I have a project and many tasks 
Uh, and so that's the example of um, you know some of the tests I did uh, for for doing the transactions. So I'm sure a lot of the systems that we might you know be, be working on have a lot more a lot of a lot a lot of complexity to deal with and and it'd be uh, you know some things that might pop up uh, you know during the development of of moving over from you know into the transaction world. Uh, although some of you might already be doing that um, already. So um, yeah, okay, so let's move on. So quick refresher, uh, you know, uh, Todd guys, you know, kind of introduced this a long time ago, but basically when the community discovered that, you know, hey, you, you know, if I make a change to uh, a related record, uh, I'm also inherently locking the parent record. And so that kind of thinking started to spark curiosity for people. And, uh, and, and you know, then thinking is like, well, what if I have a, a record, like a transaction record and I make, uh, you know, through a relationship uh, from the transaction record, I put in a key to relate it over to a project. And I then, uh, you know, either create or edit an existing project now I'm, you know, lock that project record. And then if I have other fields to put in other keys to other records, I can uh, I can get everything in a in a kind of transactional state waiting to be waiting to be uh, uh, committed. Uh, this evolved and uh, at some point uh, people discovered that I can just use one field on the on the control record, let's say the transaction record, and uh, once I put the key in, I have access to, you know, either create or edit uh, the project record, and then I can recycle and put it in a different key and point to a different table and edit and create records that way. So uh, once you're done all your changes, everything is in a kind of state in, in memory, and um, you can commit those and they all get committed at once. So uh, that has taken us a long ways and many people have embraced it in you know, various, various different ways, but that's the basic construct of what you know, we've had for, for many years with Thonaker. I don't even know if before seven, this was, this was even possible, but I know in, in Thonaker seven for a long time and beyond till now. 19 deaths, 19 deaths, pre 19 deaths six, or even now, it still works now the same way, but there's no change. Um, so uh, going to the benefits of simplification. So with transactions and uh, in, the, in the orange box that you see here uh, down on the bottom right, uh, the, uh, all the, all the, um, table occurrences that point to that one orange table occurrence, that's the transaction table occurrence for, for a system that we have that's in production. And uh, with 19.6, uh, basically all those table occurrences are not needed anymore. So if, um, if you can get rid of a lot of table occurrences, uh, I have been told by Keith, Proctor that um, that will speed up and and Clay I think mentioned this as well too that um, your the the opening of your file will will speed up um, because there's some overhead in um, in caching the joins on opening of the file that takes time so the large the larger your graph the slower it is to open and so uh, knocking off about one fifth or one sixth of those table occurrences, uh, it's definitely going to make some some noticeable, hopefully noticeable improvements in opening the file. So that's not needed anymore. And so we have simplification on the graph, plus we have um, the simplification of not having to use portals to transact our data. So that's all gone. Uh, that's not needed anymore. So we have less code to manage. Uh, Another another simplification is that on the left you have like uh, kind of um, 
an example, and this is a contrived example. I, I apologize, I didn't have a, a real example to work from, but uh, basically this thinking of like, if you're pessimistic and you wanna make sure that, you know, hey, um, I'm gonna go to a layout and in case I get an error, I wanna, I wanna trap for that. Or if I carry a new record, uh, I wanna trap for that. Or if I, you know, set a field and I'm not allowed to set the field uh, because of security, I wanna trap for that. So if you read this code, it's really hard to follow because you lose the sense of what the code is doing. And so with transactions, there's only really um, two modes in which auto abort will auto abort um, you know, a transaction. And that is um, with uh, any, any data that you're not allowed to, to set via um, that you don't have the security rights to it or that, or that validation fails in some way. Um, and we'll and we'll look at a number of examples there. But uh, so, like in the example above, if, if the layout was broken, uh, this this transaction would fail. So that's 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 something that you know. Uh, again, for for problems like that, and we'll see other other schematic problems. Uh, you, you know, you you're best off using one of the tools in, in the community uh, to to look and look at the DDR output. And, and see where your problems are and fix them. So, but otherwise, if um, if security prevented you from creating a record or you you you, you have validation on one of those fields, uh, the transaction would auto abort, and you wouldn't get this this data created. So, I think personally, I find that um, this sim has a simplification in in the and 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 it allows for better readability, better longevity because Obviously, uh, if the code is easy to understand and follow, uh, there isn't someone going to come along and say, hey, I need to rewrite this because I don't understand it. Um, you know, reduce rebuilds, um, less code to execute, um, less code to maintain, easier to read and understand, and so on. <clears throat> uh, okay, some of the challenges that I was talking about, direct versus indirect editing. So, uh, a user locks a record, the server holds the lock on the, for that user until the user commits their changes. And uh, this has been FileMaker's way to, um, you know, allow you to lock the record. So FileMaker's been, um, record locking has been pessimistic record locking. So uh, it locks the record and no other user can make changes to that same record until you commit the changes. So the, the server is actually doing some extra work here. It's it's having to keep track of that lock and uh, and then you know potentially notify or you know the users who then do try to make changes to that record, uh, etc. So know the user can make the changes while the record is locked. If we measure the time it takes to open the record, make the change, and commit it over a WAN, we would see that it is much more efficient to send the data to be transacted on the server than to do it directly from the client. So now, uh, if we measure like, like uh, running FileMaker Pro natively and then running FileMaker on a LAN, in a, in a LAN environment, there's very subtle differences. But when you go on a WAN and you have uh, latency to contend, to contend with, um, there are some dramatic differences in performance. And, uh, and so because of that, and because of, you know, a lot of the world has been having to work remotely for the past few years. Uh, we became intimately aware that uh, we needed to, you know, improve solutions for better performance. Um, and and working all over a WAN, FileMaker is just really chatty. And uh, we came up with uh, with this approach to uh, to edit the data locally. So. Uh, in most cases, even with the overhead of calling a script to send the data to the server uh, via PSOS, that process is even um, so much faster than still making the change um, directly. Uh, we can measure all of this using the release debug flags and the output generated in the dbdebug.log file. Um, and um, let's see, do I, I have some links to some talks that uh, Carl from Salian did on the release debug 
uh, flags. I invite you to check those talks out. Um, it, it helps you uh, if you turn on those flags and, and you do something over a file that's over, um, you know, your, uh, as a client to the server, uh, you can see um, how to get a sense as to what you know, FileMaker client and server are communicating and the information that they're sharing. Uh, so what if the user wants to change more than one record? You might want the user to, to use script triggers to control when the records get committed so that, you know, you know, by maybe pausing the script. So if you have, let's say, in this case, you wanted the user to, to change, you know, the project and many task records, but the task records, you know, could be either in a portal, maybe they might be on another layout or something. Uh, you, would again, you'd, because it's scripted transactions, it has to happen in the context of a script. So somehow you have to let the user make the changes, pause the script, let them find those other records. And so it can get pretty messy with trying to do this um, by you know, whatever method you come up with, either script triggers or pausing the script. Um, but pausing scripts is not ideal. Remember, these are script transactions, not, not user transactions. Um, you guys hear that airplane? No, it's just me. It's just really loud. I have my window open. OK. Uh, so instead of making the changes uh, to the record directly, we can indirectly change the record. And the, you know, uh, the other benefit is doing this, this technique is that we can um, we can also validate the data before we actually send it. So, you know, obviously, if you have constraints on your table or your fields uh, to not allow invalid data to go in there, that validation will kick in. But before it even gets there, you can validate it uh, before you send it. So the performance difference is dramatic. So a few ways to do this. Uh, in the past, we used to just have global fields and you'd have a popover and we grab the data on the record, we put it in a global field, you have it in a popover, you fill it out and you click a button, packages it up as JSON, sends it to the server and it's transacted that way. However, in, in, um, in another talk I gave last year, the year before, uh, with the, the issue with global fields and it's, it's illustrated in a more visual way with uh, some kind of animation and stuff like that is that, um, if you want to edit more than one record in a different window, the global fields is not going to be uh, um, your friend because it's going to have crosstalk because you filled out the global field in one window and now you start editing another record in another window. Those global fields have one value across your file. So that's not going to work. Um, uh, we did, uh, we eventually landed on local file editing. And, uh, and using a dedicated layout with a card window. And I'll have an example of this coming up. But the other thing we explored is we explored using a web viewer and building a whole web interaction where uh, we would have like a mini kind of form view in a web viewer, and then we would capture that data and send it. But we opted to just go uh, with the native FileMaker approach, just a little bit easier than having uh, some of the FileMaker devs have been having to learn um, how to, you know, do all the interaction with JavaScript and a web form, et cetera. So uh, this local file approach is, is kind of interesting. Um, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but basically in your hosted file, you would have a container field, and then that container field is a FileMaker file. And that FileMaker file is the thing that you would deploy when you open your solution. Uh, here's a script that, um, you know, a small script that will deploy the data that the, the, that, that file that is embedded in a container field um, in your FileMaker hosted file. And I'm using the FileMaker write, uh, you know, uh, file write uh, uh, script steps, just because if you use export, uh, field contents, uh, you'll get a dialogue. With, with this, you actually get no dialogue. So uh, normally it, it just it happens very quickly. Uh, but if you're over a WAN, you, you, you know, the export field dialogue uh, will, will show you a progress dialogue. So we 
we we opted to do this just uh, for for better UX experience to the user. Um, and this what what this does is it establishes a variable file reference to that file. So now the file you you can put anywhere, and uh, and uh, usually the file is um, something that we can we we would deploy in the, in the user's temporary directory, and the file is has no records. So uh, in this example, in the hosted file, you have your project and your tasks. Um, there's a, uh, another table called blank, which houses the, the local file that is deployed. But this, this table occurrence from the deployed file becomes active immediately. And that table or tables in that local file are now available to your system. And uh, that, that table occurrence is from the local file uh, and uh, it can be part of, you know, it can be, and, and again, this can be deployed on, as part of your on open script. So when you interact with that layout that is based on the local file, you're, you're basically ensuing no network traffic. And so here's an example. The local file is visible. Usually uh, it would be hidden. You wouldn't see it. And if you say, um, you know, I want to create a new project, uh, you could create a card window that brings up the layout that is based on the local file table occurrence. And when you fill in, uh, you know, this data, that data is actually, uh, you know, you could even click outside of the field. Uh, you're not, com you're committing that record. You're not sending any network traffic because that data that you're interacting with is, is in a local file on your computer. And uh, the file always starts off with no records, no data. So whatever data you're allowed to see is the data that you pull into it for uh, temporary reasons to make edits to it, et cetera. And, um, and so this is very elegant. Uh, it reduces the network traffic. I mean, this is a simple example, but um, sometimes you, know, you can have uh, you know, not just one record, but you can have a whole set of portals and all kinds of, of data. And, uh, and all that data can be packaged up with JSON and, and sent to the server to be transacted. Uh, this is something that uh, Carl uh, mentioned in, a, in a, a presentation he gave. And so normally, like if you use um, speed test and you check your your millisecond, um, you know, ping time. You're basically checking with your, you know, whatever network provider you're, you're connecting to, right? So that's your your latency. But your latency that you really want to measure is the latency all the way back to the FileMaker server. And this cool little technique Car, uh, Carl came up with is um, is basically using get user count to call the server, and he does this uh, ten times. And I think he said you can even just do it three or three or four times, and the average of those three or four times is enough to get an accurate uh, millisecond reading of what your latency is. And when I was doing these tests, because I was preparing for a talk in Rome, uh, my my ping time from Rome to California was 264 milliseconds, and um, that's 6,000 plus miles away. Um, Okay, so measuring performance, if, um, if we just basically create one project record and one task record, okay, in the transaction, and we look at that, and we look at uh, measuring A, measuring B, and measuring C. So uh, because it, we don't have the ability to use the aggregate functions within the transaction block, for any new or modified data. One possible technique would be to, to just go ahead and, and commit the record and right away uh, you know, modify the record uh, so that you can aggregate your, your count or your, uh, your aggregate functions at that time. And the distance between the end of A uh, and, uh, and the time it takes for B to complete uh, is very minimal, especially if it's running on the server. Uh, so, I mean, in cases where it's not needing to be, uh, you know, transactionally, it doesn't need to have transactional integrity, then this would be one 
uh, you know, viable way to do this. I'm not, I'm not proposing that this is the way that it should be done. I'm just saying that this is a potential way to, to, to solve that problem. Um, I'm not, not sure if we'll ever get um, the ability to use aggregate functions um, at, within a transaction block on even uncommitted data or modified data. So uh, that's something to be aware of. Um, so the difference in performance is dramatic. So the, the, the first part, the, the A part, the transaction block itself, um, it's, it's a dramatic difference in performance if you run it over a WAN or PSOS. So it's like over a second, if you're on a WAN with, again, with my, my, uh, my delay that I had from Rome, and then, um, and then you see the other measurements there, also 0.3 seconds and 0.7 seconds. So uh, a huge difference if you run it on server. Um, and in that example, uh, you could, you could in, in the amount of time it takes you to run one transaction on the server, uh, it, it, uh, it would be the equivalent of 149 transactions that you could do on the server when, when on the client, you could only do one of them. So that's the, the kind of um, big aha difference for, for us that we had when, um, when working on solutions that were on a WAN, that transacting the data on the server is so much more efficient. Um, okay, and this, and this is just some measurements on, um, again, using the DB debug output and aggregating the total calls using PSOS versus the WAN and the bytes sent, the bytes received, and the duration, the elapsed time. <clears throat> All right, some of the performance benefits, uh, we'll look at running locally. Sorry, did anybody have a question? Nope, okay. <clears throat> uh, and then now uh, we'll compare, uh, let's see, LAN, WAN, and, and versus PSOS. Um, so, let me move this out of the way. One second, if I can get it. No, I can't move it. All right. <clears throat> so uh, the uh, uh, the red the red column is uh, native uh, script transactions. The orange column is uh, native, just native FileMaker. So meaning that you know, uh, go to layout. Uh, create a record, go to this layout, create a record. And then the blue column is FileMaker transactions as we've had them uh, for, for the longest time. Uh, notice that the FileMaker transaction method is actually the, the slowest. And, um, and uh, FileMaker's native approach to just going to create the record in a, in a, in a layout is, uh, is actually even faster in some cases. Um, so, if you look at it over a WAN and over PSOS, there's this, this huge difference in uh, the number of, um, uh, let's see, this is, uh, this is the number of calls that you would have. Um, if you, if the calls were to, uh, in this case, uh, you're in this case, in the example on the, on the, on the left, you're making just the call to, to run the, uh, the script on the server. So, uh, in the number of calls, this is what the difference would be if you if you ran it over a WAN versus PSOS. Um, and then, then this is uh, the bytes sent. And uh, again, uh, again, here's illustrating the fact that you know performance is faster, uh, less uh, less bytes sent um, if you um, do it over a, over PSOS. And then again, bytes received very similarly. And then um, and then this is the actual duration, and it's 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 very um, kind of dramatically visible here. If we look at it a little bit more closely, uh, the script transactions wins out over the FileMaker transactions uh, when they run on server. Um, so, so that's just kind of comparing WAN versus PSOS and uh, looking at the calls and the bytes sent, received, and the end of duration. Uh, so I took this a little step further and looked at a real-world solution. 
and um, and really quickly, I, I had a latency of, uh, in this case, uh, contradictory numbers here. <laughs> I think it's the the one on the left was the one I used. Uh, that's the screenshot from the from probably the Rome uh, measurement. I had 160, 106 rows of data presented in list view, 20 columns of, of, of data showing, uh, two fields showing unstored calcs, and then uh, counter related counts from two different table occurrences. So, uh, you know, a, a unstored calc needing to, to pull down the related data to, to resolve those unstored calcs. I had uh, one complex layout. And, and that complex layout um, was uh, each field has seven conditional formatting calculations and each field was locally styled. And I had a simplified layout where I wanted to see um, what if I removed all the conditional formatting and what if I, I each field had its own style. So I had a complex layout, I had a simplified layout, and then I had, um, and then I had unstored calcs and stored calcs. So I, I put that all together and um, and ran uh, this this tool that I used to uh, flatten the data that comes back from the release debug uh, log file. And if you look at that in a visual representation, again, um, and and then there's another component to this is that uh, uncached is the um, the first time you open the file. So meaning uh, FileMaker does a great job of, 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 of caching a number of things uh, when you go in the first time. So if you open the file again the second time, you'll see uh, dramatic uh, performance improvements there. So like here we have uncached uh, unstored calcs versus stored. And then on this side, we have uh, cached uh, versus uh, unstored, unstored versus stored. Um, and so there's definitely performance benefits to be had in all areas. So removing the conditional formatting, uh, making sure that styles are, are there uh, and, um, and, and, and having stored values rather, rather than unstored values. And uh, so the number of calls also, in this case, uh, we're, we're fewer. Uh, and if we look at the, uh, the bytes sent, right? But the, the, the more impactful thing is really, again, um, this is the bytes received, uh, dramatically different there, the, the amount of data that gets sent back. Because in this case, um, we, were, uh, um, we had, once it's, once it's cached, it's so much. It's so much faster. That that's one benefit, right? Uh, so once you log in the first time, uh, you're getting the hit. But um, uh, here, maybe if you, I think I think this one's just closer. This is the cache data, and the complex layout um, scores the the poorest because it has the extra overhead of doing all the conditional formatting, etc. But um, and, and the stored values are, are, are going to be the winners. Uh, so, I, I mean, this is this one a little bit hard to follow. I admit, just because there's so many things to unpack and think about here that it's looking at. But the bottom line that I I drew away from this is that, yeah, with um, with uh, script transactions, uh, we'll be able to hopefully, in some in a lot of places, store our our, our unstored calcs. And so that will speed things up, but speeding things up um, can also be in, by doing other things um, like, you know, again, simplifying the styles, uh, being aware of the impact that uh, conditional formatting might have on a solution, and also being aware of the way FileMaker behaves when um, it's caching data that you're looking at. Um, if you look at it the first time, and then if you look at it subsequently. So all those factors play into this. Um, okay. Hey, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is Dave Knight. One quick point, and I want to see if you can, while you're on this, because you're in this caching area, which is really important. Back in the okay. day, you know, back in FileMaker 5 and 6 days, people to keep the amount of resources from flowing up and down the pipeline would have these local 
you know, opener file, data files that would point to the data on the server, but all your icons, your interface, all that stuff would reside locally. So this sort of a, a approach has been used historically. You exporting this out as a, as a new file to the temp directory, aren't you eliminating, because you also know and understand that FileMaker does a tremendous job of caching uh, after you've opened a solution. Aren't you losing some of that caching uh, um, benefit by generating that new file each time, or do you know if that gets preserved or not? No, that that file is is deployed every time you open, and uh, that file is only for editing data. It has nothing to do with uh, viewing the data. It's just for for editing the data. Yeah, maybe that's the point that you missed, David. It's, it's no, I mean I, I saw that, but I was just wondering yeah. if if by opening that local file, by doing anything with it. Are you immediately calling down cache data from the server because you've just opened it? I'm sure it's relatively uh, simple. You know, I'm sure there's not a lot of data being stored in that file. But by opening that temp file, are you triggering a call to the server to go, oh, let me pull down all this data that should be associated with this table? Uh, well, uh, it's, it's a container. It's an actual FileMaker file. And there's there's no data in it, and so you're not you're not having the impact of any cache data that you're you're looking at, and and so um, uh, yeah, it's just deploying the file, and uh, and yes, probably it on the first time you open it, uh, maybe if you left it there, uh, maybe it would it would have cached the fact that that table occurrence was there. I, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, so it's a it's it's kind of like something to explore. I'm, I'm not sure that uh, it's going to have um, any impact on on caching for for uh, for what you're you're talking about. Got it. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I can't really dig into it deeper. I just don't know the impact it would have on on the a local local file if if it was left there. Um, so. All right. Um, Dave, Vince, yeah, um, yeah. this is Steve Abrahamson in Chicago. Um, uh, Dave, I think, the, and Vince, please correct me if, if I'm wrong here. Um, Dave, I think the, the issue there is that the temp file is super, super blank. It, it's got um, almost nothing in layouts, almost nothing in records, and there's just the one container field. So even if you're losing caching benefits on that, there's so little to draw in every time you open it new that uh, it it may be a wash. Uh, but it also occurs to me that if you generate that out of a container, um, you're generating the same file, and it, I think it'll have the same UUID every single time. So, well, the um, what do you think about that? the the file has no records in it. it. The file has no records in it. No records, it. almost yeah. no layout, no no fields. Well, it has it has it it, it potentially could have. Uh, well, it has to have one layout. It has to have one layout, and that layout could just be like a blank layout. All the other layouts, you could remove them, and and the tables that exist in the file could be alias in the hosted file, and then those tables uh, basically are tables that have fields for data that you want to transact on. Um, and uh, and that's it. I mean, it it has no, it has one layout, and uh, no scripts. Um, yeah, like maybe one script to, uh, uh, maybe one script. But uh, I mean, it's very very minimal, and it would just have the tables and and the fields. And and the tables and the fields would also be minimal. It would be only the fields that you would basically be entering data for. So look, you know, if you have a project table and it's got you know, 25 fields, maybe the, the only fields that you, you're you allowing the user to enter data in are a handful. So you're really, really talking about something very, very small. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, so uh, basically I just cover in the remaining time here, uh, you know, the, the, the basic the basic building blocks that we have now in 19.6. So, so basically we have three new script steps. Uh, open transaction, revert transaction, commit transaction. Uh, in the context of, of, of uh, native script trigger uh, script transactions, uh, there's there's more stuff in 19.6, but 
in the context of that. Um, so we have a transaction scope, which is um, it's it's all or nothing basically. Uh, so if uh, the tracks, uh, you know, so if, again, if you don't have any uh, issues with the validation or security, uh, the, your your transaction should, in theory, be able to be um, to be committed. Um, and uh, so it's all or nothing. And so uh, we also have the benefit of the fact that it's uh, it's nested, which is like the if uh, block or the loop uh, block. It's it's nested. I, I wish Claris would give us uh, the ability to code fold these sections so that we could collapse if and loops and uh, and, and now transactions so that we have a, a kind of a macro view to to our code. That would be that would be helpful, but we don't have that. So, uh, but it's it is nested. Um, uh, with revert transaction, we also now have a calculation that you can define. So, in this case, in this example, um, if you decided that um, the project that you put in, if the budget, um, you know, you know, wasn't wasn't correct. You could revert that transaction based on your calculation, and uh, and then reverting it, uh, MT or true will execute the revert. It will jump to the commit transaction step. False or zero will execute the step, but no reverting will take place. So and uh, and so in the other the other important aspect to uh, to remember about script transactions is that they only work in the context of the, the transactions happen in the window that ex exists when open transaction step is executed. So in this in this example, uh, I open a transaction, I create, I go to this layout, the project layout, I create a new record, and then I create a new window. And if a new window is introduced, then anything that happens within that window is not within the transaction scope, which means that if I revert the transaction, then in this example, the project record would be removed and the task record would remain because the project record was within the transaction scope. And then uh, the, the new task record, because it happened in a new window, was no longer within that transaction scope. Um, so there might be some reasons you'd want to do something like this, but just be aware that transactions only happen within the context of the window that exists when the transaction step is executed, open transaction step is executed. Only one transaction can be running at a time. Uh, so uh, that's 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 the, uh, there's only one script running at a time anyway. I don't know how we would do it so they could run more than one transaction at a time, other than, uh, you know, of course you could, you could have code that you could say, call this other script and this script says, um, you know, open transaction, but that won't work because it will uh, it will know that there's one transaction running. So there's only one transaction that could be running at a time. Uh, there's a new fun get function called get transaction state, and uh, this function returns one if currently in an open transaction and zero if not currently in a transaction. Uh, if you use truncate table. Uh, to remove data in a table and then want to revert it, uh, chunk of table will remove the records and cannot be reverted. So uh, that instead, uh, you'd want to use delete all records instead. Uh, and I, can, I don't remember who it was, but uh, uh, someone during the ETS pointed out that like, hey, uh, you know, deleting records or doing some some activity with transactions was actually slower. And there's probably good reason for that. The fact that, you know, uh, in this case, it's probably uh, iterating through all those records. And uh, if you decide you want to revert them, it has to bring them back. So uh, with, you know, truncate, I think it's a different story in the, in the way it works. So, uh, so it's, you're not gonna actually see some places, uh, you know, faster performance just by the fact that you slap open transaction and commit transaction around your scripts. 
Um, if you want to be able to revert any of the deleted records, you want to definitely use delete all records instead of trun truncate. Uh, and then the other thing I learned was that uh, the behavior of validation um, uh, affects the, uh, the type of validation will affect how the uh, auto abort behavior works. So, uh, and I learned that um, some validations uh, can happen on the, on the data that you put in. Like if you're saying I want a field to have a strict number value versus I want a field to have a unique value. For the unique value to kick in, you have to commit the record at that time uh, it can it, it can look at the index and see if another value already exists. So the only time that kicks in is when the, you you um, you actually commit the record, whereas the other um, validations that are in green here will happen at the time you modify the the data. So uh, so in this case, in this example, if I um, if I were, I were to have this validation on this field and I wanted it to be strict number number only. Uh, when this step is executed and I'm trying to set text in a field that I'm requiring it to be number, I get an error. Number value does not meet validation entry options. And it would jump to the commit transaction step and abort the transaction. When that step is executed, it also returns that error. And if you're in the debugger, you'd see in the debugger, appended to the end of the error, you'd see the script name and the, and the step number. So if that step where uh, you know, the, you're setting the budget field is step seven, you'd see uh, you know, the script name and, and the number seven next to it. Uh, if you have uh, validate data in this field only during data entry, then in that case, uh, all the validations are not performed. The record gets created within valid data and script continues and no errors are returned. Again, understanding the difference between field changes and record commit validation uh, types is important. And so if I have a field where I have a unique value that's re required, then uh, validation only happens at the time that the commit transaction step is executed. So in this case, if I, you know, I had a budget that I had a project where I'm only allowed to have a, a budget uh, 32 uh, of 32 dollars on a project one time. I, it's a stupid example, but nonetheless, uh, if I set that uh, budget to 32, uh, the script will continue to execute. But when it comes time to uh, to commit the transaction it will give you this uh, this error value and field is not unique as required in validation entry options. And then uh, you'll get the script name and the step number again, but this time you'll get the step number associated with the commit transaction step, but not the step number that had the validation error. So there's subtle differences there in the way that is reported. Um, another example here, if I set a field that is missing, and uh, if I was in person, I'd ask you guys, what do you think is going to happen? Because I'm setting a field, uh, and I'm not going to get the data in that field. Uh, so the, the thing that's going to happen is uh, there is a there's an error that's going to get returned. However, the execution will continue when the commit transaction step is executed records get created and the string plan doesn't get put anywhere. So this transaction was successful. However, there's a schematic error in your, in your code. Um, and so that's something that the, the script transaction does not abort on. So errors like this, uh, the script transaction architecture will not abort on things like that. Uh, set field by name, another example, um, you know, I'm trying to set the budget field, but I, but I named uh, set field by name, blah, blah. So it's not going to find it. And so in this case, the same thing here, you'll get an error reported uh, for that step. However, the execution will continue. And then when the commit transaction is executed, 
records get created, but the budget field doesn't get a value. Uh, layout is missing, same thing. Uh, structural error, errors don't, um, don't hamper the transaction. However, it will hamper your code because it won't go to that layout and you'll end up creating two project records and, and uh, a lot of mayhem will ensue from, from that. So um, you can use tools like Inspector Pro, Base Elements, Crosscheck, or FM Perception to find these structural errors and correct them. And uh, you know, uh, then you'll you'll at least be free of those potential problems. Um, let's see, non-related, non-data related, non -related um, operations. So in this case, I am uh, I'm going to try and add an account halfway through my transaction. And it so turns out that I have an account uh, with the name admin already. And so uh, I'll get an error, uh, but the uh, execution of the, the script will continue. And uh, the error, account error doesn't prevent the transaction from completing. And the set error capture only prevents the dialogue from showing. So again, here, uh, not security or validation, uh, data related, the, the errors would allow the transaction to continue and not abort it. Uh, here are some interesting ones. Open dialogue in the middle of a transaction. Like if this was done locally, um, you can open edit, save, find dialogues. Uh, some of these dialogues are modal, some of them are not. Um, so, you know, I don't know what the use case is for for doing some of these, but uh, sometimes the script is executed, the dialogue is open, and the script is suspended. So it's a little bit like the technique that uh, John Renfrew and Mark Scott came up with when, when we had card windows, where you can install a timer to run, but then you install a card window right away. And the timer, the script, is attached to the window behind the, the card window. And so this is interesting behavior to uh, exploit or explore. I don't know what the right word would be, but uh, I, I know that when I brought this up uh, with uh, Jason Erickson, he found this one to be very interesting. He said, oh, that's interesting. I'm in the middle of a transaction and uh, I can open up the managed database dialog. And then the, uh, the script is suspended. And uh, however, it auto commits whatever was done at that point. And uh, the, when the dialogue is dismissed, the script can resumes. I've never, I don't remember seeing this behavior before with scripting. Uh, I, I feel like in the past, like if you were inside a script and you go into define database, I don't even know if you can go, I don't even know if you could go into define database before. I, I never tried it, but anyway, interesting behavior. Uh, just something I'm pointing out and, um, yeah, so that's, and then there's all these other open dialogue uh, options and, uh, you know, whether or not it, it has um, kind of impact on the, on the transaction or not, and, and if it's uh, modal or not modal. Uh, so uh, security, uh, coming up on, uh, on an hour here, so I have just a few more slides left. Um, security uh, definitely will have an impact on auto aborting. So like in this case, uh, I have a privilege set that doesn't allow creation of a project record and I try to create a record in the project table, it will automatically jump to the commit transaction step uh, and uh, will auto abort the transaction because you don't have the ability to create that record. Uh, same thing with fields. If you don't have uh, access to a field, and um, you try to set a field where you don't have access, then um, uh, again, if you, uh, you, you it will auto abort, but if you, in this case, I'm, I'm showing off some of the, the other new uh, get functions that can return the get last error detail and get last error location. And, um, and in this case, using those in, in a, a kind of an intermingled way, you can get, the location of the actual field that have the error, and um, and then what what um, what the commit 
uh, error. Uh, you'll get an error at the commit step as well, too. Um, uh, let's see, a couple of other things. Uh, again, the security, no access there, returns the field cannot be modified. Uh, in the debugger, um, again, you'll get the name of the, uh, the script and the step number. Uh, these are two areas that, um, that I didn't test enough. And at the time when I was testing script transactions, they weren't really working. Um, at least the skip data entry validation option thing wasn't working. And I never got around to completing the testing on that. And so, um, but these are two options that you can turn on uh, or off. Uh, and when you uh, when you run this open transaction script step, and um, and then this other thing I didn't I didn't also have time to explore, but something that I think Alec is going to spend more time getting into. But there are uh, custom error codes that you can define, and uh, the condition is basically the calculation that you define for reverting the transaction. But there are error codes, and all of these are custom calculations that you can have access to. And, um, and so I don't know how we'll exploit those necessarily, but uh, there's a, a range of custom error numbers between 5,000 and 5,499 that you can define specific error codes for. Um, again, I'm not sure how we'll exploit those. Um, it's, and then there's those two new get functions that return information about the uh, the error detail and the error location. And then again, uh, going back to this, um, uh, actually this should say microseconds, that's a typo, but that's uh, time in millionths of a second. And there's a blog post um, that I did uh, about that, which is uh, kind of cool. It shows you, um, shows you how a uh, new window, when it runs on the server, actually doesn't have as much overhead as it does on the client. And measuring that using microseconds, uh, you get, UT, get UTC microseconds um, uh, revealed that. So who knows what else this, uh, this fun little function will reveal. Uh, recap real quick, uh, we, we took a look at the refresher, what, what we've had all these years. We talked about some of the challenges, uh, direct editing versus indirect editing, and then file maker aggregate, uh, uh, aggregate functions. We didn't dive into that in any way. Uh, I really leave that as a, an exercise to the viewer to, to think about and contemplate about their solutions because solutions could be, could be needing transactional integrity or you could get by with eventual integrity and, and that's fine too. So it really up to the solution. Uh, we talked about benefits, simplification and performance. We talked about um, all the kind of ins and outs of actual the, the, the core mechanics of the script transaction, how it aborts, uh, what things uh, like, uh, like it needs to run in a window and, and various other things that we talked about there. And then we talked about UTC microseconds just briefly. And that's it. Um, these are places you, you can uh, get in touch with me if you have any follow-up or questions or anything that you'd like to uh, share. Always happy to, to share with you all. And it's strange being uh, here talking in my room and not seeing you all. But anyway, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Vince. I think we can open it up to uh, questions now. Let's see there. Sure. Couple in the chat. I know Steve had one about um, using delete all in a transaction, and you know if there are a lot of records, is there an impact on memory, um, sort of until the end of the transaction? Basically, does the filemaker have to sort of hold on to all those records um, so they can be restored in case uh, you know you you do that? Um, I don't know. I'm a, I'm assuming yes. I mean, you know, it, depend, it all depends, right? I mean, how many records are we talking about? Hundreds, thousands, millions? Like, right. you know, I think uh, I think with anything, you you will definitely see, um, uh, you know, a performance hit if you have uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of records to delete, and it, it'll take some time. Well, my my uh, definition in the in the question was 
a lot. So I guess that kind a of lot. Just, a lot is, but um, it's not about performance. It's about um, if you go through and delete that, and then you've got more to your transaction, what's the memory impact? Because uh, it, it might have to revert that, right? And so is FileMaker storing all of those records in local cache data? Um, and and actually that kind of brings up another question of, you know, what happens if, if FileMaker crashes in the middle of a transaction? So any thoughts on those? Uh, if it crashes in the middle of a transaction, um, that stuff is is not going to be, um, how would you say, re recoverable? Um, I don't think. Uh, I, I would think that it, it would not be, um, because it hasn't, like, especially if, if you're in an environment where you're, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about server client, right? Client server, and, and you lose your, you have this big script that's running and it's doing all this stuff transactionally, and then your network connection drops or whatever happens, you you just, your, your, your file crashes or whatever, that transaction is gonna be lost, I believe. Uh, if anybody else knows for, for a fact, um, I mean, I wish Keith or Clay were here, but that's my understanding. It hasn't been sent to the server, but it'll be lost. So Chris, if you're not abstracting it and you have progressive backups running and, you know, part of your trend, you know, you open a transaction, you start setting fields. I thought progressive backups were aware of those fields being changed. Maybe if you haven't committed, they would lose them. Well, I guess you haven't committed them, right? So yeah, you probably would, that whole transaction would be gone. Yeah. But that also means that the deleted records would not be deleted, right? That's correct, because in theory, those are all happening on your machine. They, they haven't been sent to the server to actually have the work to, to, to delete them. Um, you know. But isn't that partly the point of transactions? <laughs> What's that? That's isn't the point that partly the point? The reason you're using transactions is it, it either happens or it doesn't. And doesn't yeah, yeah, exactly. halfway happen. So yeah. if you crash from the server, the transaction doesn't happen is one of the reasons you're using this process. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, during the ETS, I mean, I, I found it, I found it uh, fascinating because it just like it was great uh, because the community was was really discussing this topic heavily. And when uh, we first got it, we didn't even have the calculation to to use for reverting a transaction. And the calculation came about during the ETS cycle, uh, which was because Clarice was listening to the feedback and and. Uh, you know, uh, wondering what they could do to address some of the, the you know, the concerns of the feedback given. And uh, I've never, I mean, it's on all my years in FileMaker and Claris, I've never seen like such active participation by, by Claris trying to, you know, this agile method of like, okay, we're gonna work on this, we're gonna refine it. And, and in during the process, we, we as a community had impact on the, on the final output of, of it. Although some community members will say not enough because there was some suggestions that you know weren't addressed. And but the hope is that they will look at that in the future and make some further changes. So it's encouraging, encouraging to see. And I mean we have script transactions. It's it's amazing. It's I never thought that would that we would see that day. <laughs> You know, Vince, if you use that technique where you actually sort of poop out a little file and store the pending transaction in there and you crashed, part of your startup routine could be to, de to detect, do I have a uh, file sitting out there on the drive? And if I do sort of pick up where I left off. Yeah, I mean, mind you, if you crash FileMaker, that file might have issues and, you know, would go through recovery, but sure. who knows, it might not have issues and it, and it would open up just fine. And but you got a great point, Chris. That's definitely uh, if you if you bake it into your startup to check, hey, the files there. Or is it any data in there that uh, hasn't been transacted? Then you know you could bring that back up. Uh, great point, Chris. And you have to make sure not to uh, store those in the temp directory because obviously those would be yes. gone. <laughs> uh, yeah. Although on the Mac, it, it doesn't behave exactly the 
this, uh, I mean, the temp directory, from what I could tell, doesn't get cleared out um, like as soon as you quit FileMaker. I think it's, I mean, on Windows it's different. The temp directory is like, as soon as you quit FileMaker, it's gone from what I, from what I remember. Uh, but the Mac side, I think you have to actually have a restart for that temp directory to get wiped out. Uh, I think if you crash and restart FileMaker, the data in that temp directory is still there. At the very um, least, I believe FileMaker creates a new random temp directory each time. So yeah. even so if maybe it's you still there, I might not be able to find it. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, you probably need a place where you could get access to it. So desktop. Yeah. <laughs> Just put files all over that user's desktop. They don't, they don't, they won't mind. Yeah, exactly. They won't see overwrite, a thing. They won't care. Nah, overwrite their files. Who cares? <laughs> they, they already have 300 files on their desktop. So what are yeah. they for? <laughs> they're not, not going to see. They're not going to notice just another file on their desktop. <laughs> um, so Vince, yeah. I have been putting the links uh, that you yeah. in cool. the Thank chat. Mostly, mostly when it was relevant, a couple of them are out of out of sequence. But I'll also send that list if it's okay with you to the uh, to the mailing list so people can can reference them later. Cool. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Jonathan. Of course. Uh, Thank you for yeah. for presenting. Um, any any last questions for Vince before we wrap up? Uh, I just wanted to say that in the. Um, scenario you gave where you uh, you know you're committing the transaction but there's a schematic issue maybe the field was gone or renamed or something like that where you have explicit sets and I guess the same would work for um, you know set field by name or even a, a security issue if instead of doing explicit sets like that you just sort of bundled everything up into a big name value pair blob of JSON and then loop through it you could just loop through and after each set you could error trap it and that way you don't have this huge you know, wall of set, check, set, check, set, check. It would just be a looped process. It would be very compact. And as soon yeah. as you encountered an issue, you could just kick out of it and say, we have a problem and it's on this field. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, good point, Chris. Great, all right. Well, I see in the chat, lots of people thanking you, Vince. So again, thanks very much for uh, for sharing with us this morning. I'm gonna pause recording. All right, so for our next presentation, we're very happy to have Robert Halsey here from Claris. Um, I was just thinking how, you know, in the old days, um, you know, with annual or every 18 month releases, you know, you, we'd have someone we were meeting in person at the time, obviously. We, if we were fortunate to have someone from FileMaker uh, get on a plane, fly down, you know, come to the meeting, come present, and um, Rosemary, I'm sure you participated in that sometimes, and other people from from uh, FileMaker, and then that was pretty much it, you know, until we'd see people at DEF CON. Um, and obviously with the move to doing meetings on Zoom, uh, it's been a lot easier, I think, you know, certainly on your end to participate. But also, given the, all the changes going on with the platform and new products and things like that, it's you know meeting, hearing from you guys once a year or eighteen months would be mm -hmm. seem in, interminable. Um, and so we, you know we've had a lot more participation from Claris in I would say in the last year than we ever had historically, and I think it's been very valuable for this group. Hopefully, we've been able to give some valuable feedback. So I just want to say how much we appreciate, um, you know, your willingness to uh, jump on the, the meetings and, and share what's going on and, and also do something which I think was less common in the past of sharing things that were in the future. So um, anyhow, just want to give our appreciation and uh, hand, the, hand the floor over to you, Robert. Thank you, Jonathan. And, and, and right back at you. I mean, th this is such a powerful and, and useful um, uh, uh, use of our time. I mean, hearing from you all directly, what's landing, what's not, you know, we're very excited about where we're taking Claris. Um, and, you know, we've recognized that some of our messaging in the past has not landed well and, um, or has led to some of the confusion uh, in the community that we've seen. 
Uh, but these opportunities that you all give us has been incredibly helpful. So I'm glad to see the perception that we're being more uh, involved in the community. Um, and again, just thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, I just want to say, start off, um, uh, hello, everyone. I, I know most of the faces here, uh, but for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Robert Holsey. I've been a product manager here at Claire's for a little over a decade, um, working primarily with FileMaker Pro and Go and WebDirect. And most recently, I'm uh, leading the effort around the Claris platform, uh, which includes not just Studio, but how Connect and Pro um, work together in a cohesive single platform. Uh, what I want to do today, I've got a, a demo uh, that I want to anchor us around um, to sort of, um, as I'm going through, as people have questions, I can dig into a little bit more detail as necessary. Uh, Andy kind of stole my thunder uh, last uh, meeting with you all and used some of my slides, um, but I think that was a great introduction to what I want to talk about today. Uh, and as Rosemary alluded to, sort of a preview setting up for the uh, webinar we've got coming up in a couple of weeks. To kick things off, though, I think we can do reactions here. Could I just get quick reactions on from anyone that has had a chance to play with Studio so far? Just want to get a rough sense of the folks in the room. I'm seeing if I can actually see more than just the ones that are on my screen. Hold on. Okay, getting a couple notifications. Cool. Um, is there anyone that has not seen Studio at all at this point? Okay, uh, so a few. Okay, cool. I just wanted to get a sense of uh, altitude here. So let me share my screen. Hold on, I'm getting the privacy warnings. Hopefully this, just as we turn it on, one sec. I think I'm gonna have to quit and relaunch, unfortunately. So give me one second. I've been on Zoom before. I'm not sure why it's doing this. So one sec, guys. While Robert's uh, doing that, have most people received an NFR uh, studio at this point? I know there are plans to distribute distribute it, um, and it, I guess maybe it's been rolling out gradually. But uh, just curious, how many people have gotten gotten uh, NFRs at this point? I've not. I've not. What's Where's an NFR? I'm not. Where's that supposed to be uh, showing up? I have not. Okay, doesn't sound like most people have. So I, I didn't miss an email. <laughs> it doesn't sound like. <laughs> no, I'm as as far as the last I heard, um, the not for resale for specifically for Claris partners are coming very soon, I believe. Um, I don't know exact timing. Robert may be able to to help, and um, the free access for everybody is also. Um, coming soon. And for that, we have a, a, a sign up link. So you can find those links in the community. And I think we've shared it also out on social to um, sign up to be notified when the free version is available. Yeah, signed up. No, no, no word yet. Yeah, yeah, Robert, there's a question while you're off of where what the status of the partner NFRs are. Yep. Uh, uh, so partner Oh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yep, cool. Yeah, so the partner NFRs uh, should start being rolling out in the coming weeks. Um, and I caught the very end of that. Uh, uh, Rosemary was talking about sort of broad free tier. Um, and that's uh, sort of next in line for us to start rolling out. Um, I think I heard the, the idea that uh, we have folks signed up already. So those will be the first group uh, onboarded through the free tier. Uh, but we're making good progress there. We, we've done some early tests on it. Uh, mechanics are all looking well. So we're now looking at how do we scale this out to the larger audience. All righty, let me try this again. Hopefully the share will work this time. Promising. Can you yep. all see my screen? Yes, Beautiful. we can. Okay, so again, you know, as you guys, I, I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat uh, window. It might be a little difficult, but if, if you've got questions, you want to unmute and jump in. That's totally cool. Um, hide the camera here. I thought we'd start off somewhere that we're all pretty familiar with, uh, which is Claris Pro. Um, this is a pretty typical app, simple app that you might build uh, with the platform. 
here we're just tracking some events. Uh, we've got folks that are registering. We've got some to-do items that we're tracking and some purchase requests for you know, making sure that we've got whatever content we need for the actual event. Um, I could use this as is today. I could you know, have drop downs for my statuses. Um, you know, I could build a process for, for uh, processing the purchase requests. Uh, but this is an opportunity for me to leverage Studio to extend the solution in sort of new interesting ways. And while this app at the moment sort of on the surface seems pretty typical, if we were to look under the hood, uh, the relationship graph, we'll find that actually the bulk of these tables are currently moved over to Studio. Um, some of which I had started off in Pro and then migrated uh, through a migration option that uh, if I go over to my um, results table, uh, you'll see that there's a button here to migrate. So as long as the table um, has the uh, supported field type, so text, uh, date, and number, uh, and not fields like summary and, and containers for now, you can migrate that whole table over. Actually, let me bring that relationship back up again to call out one other thing. Um, the only exception to this at the moment is I am storing my images for the events in a Draco table. And that's just purely because we haven't uh, completed the uh, pipeline integration between the container support we have in Studio today and then consuming that on the pro side. That's something that we're actively working on. So in theory, I could have an entire Claris Pro solution with all the data stored in the Claris Studio side. Now, realistically, I don't know how often that would really be something that you would want to have be the case, um, but there are advantages to having things stored in Studio versus having them stored in Pro in the Draco engine. Um, Studio, as you may have probably heard, the uh, back end is, is currently, or the, the back end database we're currently using is Mongo. Um, now, it's important to understand that we're building Studio to be uh, database uh, agnostic. Uh, we're choosing MongoDB uh, because there's, uh, I think, a lot of value that it can bring to the platform and scale and performance options. Um, but in the future, that might be something that either we want to change or even potentially open up in the community so that you could change with that backend databases. The, the main point of it, though, is that we give you the tools so that from a case by case basis, you can choose what makes the most sense given that particular challenge. You know, Draco has been great for a long time. It's it's uh, it has a bit of a trade off in, in how chatty it is between the client and server, but that ensures you know that you've got that data integrity. When people make changes in one place, it's immediately available and updated in another. And it has baked in rules on you know last in last out and how we handle. Uh, record collisions, that's going to be different than what we do on the uh, Mongo side. And so in cases where you do need more scale and performance over top of that, um, you know, precise uh, data, data integrity across uh, clients, uh, you may choose that path instead. The other thing I want to call out is that um, one of the other things that we're working on right now is not having to have it be a full migration of that table in order to stand uh, views on top of those data tables. So we're looking at potentially being able to move parts of a table over, um, or, and I think this is where it's gonna be more interesting for us, leaving the data in Draco and in, in your FileMaker solution or Claris Pro solution, and then having it just be displayed or processed on the studio side. So those are a couple of things that we're working on currently. Um, I'll stop there for a moment, just as we talk about the integrations between Pro, and now I wanna switch over to primarily looking at Studio, uh, but I wanted to stop here if there's any immediate questions on what I just described. Cool. If Robert, not, actually, sorry, oh, I, I had one. Yep, go for it. Um, just in terms yep. of, you know, if you're gonna do that sort of integration, obviously the, um, the Studio tables live on your servers in the cloud. Um, mm -hmm. the, the the Drago tables could be living, you know, on a server in a data center or on prem, whatever it is. What sort of issues are there for for I guess Studio getting access to that those tables, you know, through firewalls and through whatever other you know uh, routing issues there might be. Great question. Um, so the. I mean, obviously you would have to have some sort of network connection external. So we understand that we've got some cases where you are in a walled off garden and you have no communication externally to the outside world. Uh, and in those cases, at this point in time, Studio would not be something that you could extend. 
Um, I forget offhand exactly what port we're going over um, that you would need to make sure it was open in a firewall like you typically would be. Uh, but I think we're, we've consolidated now. So as long as you, you were able to launch Claris Pro, and of course it requires that login of your Claris ID at launch, from that point on, you should be fine. Um, but I can validate that or if anyone has seen something to the contrary, but that, that's what my expectation is. Uh, we totally understand that there are use cases where you do need that, um, whether it's because you, you're in a situation where you've got your data locked down or your, your internal network locked down rather, um, or you just need to be in better control of your data and where it lives. Um, and while we're not making this a focus right now as we're standing up this foundation, we're focusing on the cloud integrations first, uh, we do know that we, we're going to need to solve that problem. We still see the on-prem aspect of what FileMaker has had for a long time as a critical um, differentiator value add for us over a lot of our competitors. Uh, so if you're running into scenarios where you can't get to Studio just yet because you've got these requirements, please keep talking to us, but understand that this is something that is on our radar. I think that was Jonathan. Did that, did it, did that get at your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. And it, the goal is to have just one port that would need to be open because I know for some other things in the past, obviously for pro clients, we have just 5003, but for mm -hmm. other other things with WebDirect and the admin, you know, there were multiple ports and ranges of ports and uh, yep. anything, anyhow, anything that could be due to simplify like, hey, open this port would certainly make it a lot easier to communicate with with IT and people who would need to be doing that. Absolutely. And I, I spent years in support. So I, I, I finally remember the the many <laughs> calls I spent uh, helping with with uh, port uh, firewalls. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and that that's something that, you know, more broadly, not even specific to this, you, you'll hear us talk about um, sort of being better citizens with IT. Um, you know, we, we've definitely heard the feedback in certain situations where, uh, you know, IT is sort of allergic to us because of the things like you're mentioning here, Jonathan. So there's a, a larger effort in general at Claris to, to sort of be better citizens there. Um, and I'm pretty sure we're down to one port. I don't, please don't hold me to that specifically because I'm not 100% sure, but um, if it's not one, it's two. It's not like we've got a whole range like you've seen from us in the past. Great, thanks very much. Beautiful. Uh, so, okay, so now we, uh, and we, we can come back to pro, uh, but I just wanted to kind of get a level set, do a little bit of a tour through um, what, we're, what we've got in Claire Studio, um, and then we'll dig into some of the actual functionality. Um, so for anyone that hasn't uh, played with Studio yet or hasn't seen it, when you log in, again, with your Claris ID, you'll be brought to the views page by default. When we started building Studio, um, we started off with a very narrow use case around data collection. Um, and some of you may have heard me talk about this before, but the reason we did that was we were standing up new teams, new technologies, and we wanted to pick something that was very narrow uh, so that we, could, we had focus as a team in what we were building, um, but also picking something that we knew that the community needed because practically every business and, and or, or company out there has some flavor of needing to do data collection and, and reach out to their customer base. And we knew that while it was doable today with the platform and FileMaker, it accrued additional overhead, whether that be in licensing or just maintaining APIs or whatever it may be. So it felt like an opportunity for us to not only focus our team, but go after something meaningful for the community. Um, it was very narrow. And so we've definitely gotten some feedback on customers that want to move off of a Jot forms or Google forms, but there's some key elements missing. And we've been rapidly moving to um, address those uh, gaps. And you'll see a little bit of that in a moment. Um, and then begin to expand on those use cases into up-leveling uh, insights that you may be collecting in your business. And you'll see some examples of dashboards here. Um, and then starting to get into sort of more complex types of solutions, things like being able to build a project management solution with the ingredients in Studio. But when we started off here, we knew that um, we were going to be starting small and only having a few views. And so what you're seeing in this sort of information architecture of Studio um, is our early days of figuring out what really is important as far as structure here. We wanted to have views be um, really easy to mix and match uh, for a given use case. If you think about how apps work today in the FileMaker space, um, if I've got a series of layouts in one app, it's pretty difficult for me to move those same layouts and their structure and their logic over to another app. Um, and so we sort of got into this artificial um, sort of bucketing of uh, functionality that 
you may want to reuse for different people um, or different use cases. Another example is within an application today in FileMaker, um, you have different users that are only using one small section of your app, you know, a handful of layouts or one part of a workflow. Um, and so then you had to go in as a developer and build in logic that says, okay, well, if you're from this team, then you got to go route it to this direction. And if you're part of this team and maybe these permissions, you get routed over here. Um, and so we wanted to start off for a place where we weren't as locked in. And so while, that's why you're seeing these sort of free flowing forms, or, or I should say views uh, surface at this level. And then in order to give you some structure to start organizing it so that you can start having uh, you know, maybe the people that are responsible in this case, we're talking about events for making sure that, you know, all the purchase requests go through and keep on people uh, doing their, their to-do actions. You can come in here and create a hub, uh, which is really just taking a collection of views and, and putting them together for a particular user to accomplish a goal that is, you know, processing um, uh, requests, let's say. <clears throat> and you can come in here and start adding different views. Um, so we haven't created all the views that we'll end up using, but let's say I add in here my, my purchase requests and let's do items. These get added to a view that I can then share with any member of my team that is a licensed Claris user. Um, I'll pause there for a moment. I did see that there's a question here in the chat of will Studio support uh, triggered actions of uh, uh, following data entry. Uh, so entries such as emails being sent. Uh, yes, it will. Um, and in fact, uh, we're doing work right now to more tightly integrate the capabilities of Connect into Studio. Uh, so that let's say you've got someone signing up for um, your upcoming events. Um, maybe you have them automatically added to a MailChimp mailing list as an example. So they start getting your marketing campaigns moving forward um, or they're submitting events or sessions that they want to do. And you could have that start populating a calendar view, you know, a Google calendar that's public so that you can start coordinating with other members that are helping put on that event. Um, you'll start seeing the first instances of this uh, in the not too distant future uh, where we'd be able to trigger events in, in Connect based off of what's going, you know, records being created in studio. Um, but we that's sort of a stepping stone to where we wanna get where we can more tightly integrate that experience. Um, so that as we drill into some of these views and again into maybe the signup form, when the user clicks that button, it doesn't just submit the data, but it also then triggers a, a flow or a connection to some integration you've set up in, in Connect. Cool, I see the excellent, uh, great to hear. Um, Continuing our tour here a little bit, um, you know, these areas are pretty straightforward. Um, I do want to call out before I get too much farther, I am showing you our QA environment. Uh, so there are some things in here that um, if you're using our production environment, it currently may look a little different, make look a little rougher because we do have some early code being checked in here um, and you'll get some sneak peeks into some stuff that's on the horizon. Um, so some of these things, I, I call it out because we're, we're moving to groups, which not is not yet in production here, but this will start aligning us to what we support today in Claris Cloud, in FileMaker Cloud um, and Connect, where you've got groups so that you could then start assigning individuals to groups. And then just like we're sharing hubs to individuals, share those to that group instead. We've got downloads, and this is where you'll be able to have access to uh, the latest builds of Claris Pro that connect with Studio, as well as server as well, and uh, Claris Go. Um, I think everyone on this call is in the US, but just as a heads up at the moment, Claris Go is only available uh, for English US customers. We'll be rolling that out to uh, the rest of the world here shortly. Then access to uh, your Connect, uh, Claris Connect and customer console for accessing cloud if you were. Um, I do wanna call out this help section, uh, something that um, we're going into taking sort of an evolution of what we had in FileMaker of trying to call out what's new, why you should care, uh, doing it in sort of a more light and friendly way, um, and then allow you to drill into more details as necessary. This goes all the way back to our initial release, so you can really get to see a timeline of the progression we've made. Uh, the other thing in the help is starting to get built out uh, is not just specific to Studio, but it starts talking about some of the core differences between Claris and FileMaker platforms, how to convert your apps, which is a, a very simple process of going from a .fmp12 to a .claris file. Um, and then some help on getting started with server. Uh, so as you're starting to pick this up, uh, this is a great resource for you. And this is gonna to continue to be added to um, in the coming months. 
Uh, there is a feedback section here um, in the current in production version. It looks a little different uh, than what you'll see here, which actually uh, opens up a Clara Studio form uh, to start collecting uh, feedback. Um, you know, we're, we're dog fooding as much as we can of the platform, just like we have for FileMaker uh, for years. Um, this hasn't rolled out just yet, uh, but it's similar functionality in product. As you guys are playing with this, especially as that free tier starts rolling out to everyone, uh, this is really handy to sort of capture in the moment, uh, whether it's friction points you're running into or enhancements that you need. Um, you know, one of the things that we're really interested in is we're building out these ingredients um, is sort of the end to end, right? We've got the sort of core building blocks, uh, but as you try to solve a, um, a real world scenario, if there's like carries where you can get 95% of the way there and where those boundaries are hitting. So make it here is, is a great resource on top of obviously the community. Uh, but what's great about this uh, is it's a direct line. Everything that comes in through this goes directly to the product team. We review these um, tickets and uh, while we can't respond directly to you because we won't know who you are, uh, I just want you to understand that that's not going into a black box. It comes directly to the team. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Rosemary, for the link to the help. And uh, then we have our team switcher. Um, I want to also call out here that at the moment, the way this works is um, if I'm part of multiple Claris ID, you know, sorry, my Claris ID is part of multiple teams. I will be able to choose uh, in a drop down which of those teams I'm focused on at the moment. Uh, I do want to call out though that we're working on uh, two things that will improve this in the future. It's not something that we're focused on right this moment, uh, but something that we have on the horizon. Um, one is that you know as you're developing or as you're a developer trying to support your customers, we totally recognize that right now we've got a challenge in our licensing for cloud where in order to support that customer, you have to take up one of their slots. Um, so if they bought a five pack as an example, you're one of those five people. Um, so we're, we're, we're addressing that uh, so that you as developers can come in and, and freely be able to help support your developers. The other thing that we, we, we know that we need to get to is if you're supporting 50 customers, this UI is not going to be well suited for that. Um, and so we're thinking about ways of how we could um, give you more of a hub as developers of, of a better view of your customers. Again, we, we've got foundational elements to get Studio stood up here, but I wanted you to understand where we were sort of heading in our thinking in this area. And then finally, um, obviously you can sign up for accounts. One other thing I wanted to call out here is this concept of an extended account. Uh, this is a um, really a stopgap for us at the moment. Um, we're using Claris ID for authentication for most of the technologies and that's really key for us in order to make sure that, you know, as you're navigating, whether it's through Pro or Connect or Studio, that you have one authentication that you're using. And this is a cohesive experience, not just from your logging in perspective, but what access to data you have across those. Um, I will also call out that in the future, we're working on external authentication and, and not forcing you to use Claris ID specifically, but still having that single, you know, that single uh, account authentication. But in the meantime, uh, we had to make a, a, a sort of stopgap fix for how we would handle um, data API, server-side scripting, and web direct users. Um, and what this requires the user to do at the moment is come in here once they've had their Claris ID uh, and create an extended account, just specify a, a username and password. And what that does is essentially tie a local account that you're more familiar with on the FileMaker, in the FileMaker world to this Claris ID uh, so that they can then log in, but we're still tying them up and making sure that we understand who they are and what access they should have across the platform. And this will continue to improve uh, as an experience as we, we build out from here. Okay, before I dive into uh, some examples here of these views um, and sort of show you how we're extending the solution, any questions on sort of the what you saw here as, as part of the tour? Okay. I, I um, wanted so, to add oh, a little tip. Um, sure. If you're doing the feedback, what I've been doing is I take a screenshot where I typed in the feedback and then a screenshot of what I'm giving feedback on. If we do this new window kind of thing, I lose that. I, I'm, can you say that one more time, Beverly? Yeah. Sure I okay. Totally so, it. so if I'm working on a, on the spreadsheet, for example, and mm -hmm. and I'm trying something and it's not working for my own records, I open up that feedback and type in the box what the feedback is. But I take a screenshot mm -hmm. of everything, so I know 
why I said what I said. But if, if this is going to open another window, I'm going to lose that. Great. I guess, great I, I guess I make two screenshots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, OK, thanks. No, great, great, great. Great feedback, Beverly. Um, you know, the this is something the team's actively looking at. Um, so I'll, I'll convey that. If they've got follow up questions, which they might, um, I'll, I'll be in touch with you. Okay. And Robert, I had a quick question about that extended sure. account. So just mm -hmm. reading the text in that screen. So it says to use the same email address as your Clara's ID, but then is it a different password? Yeah, yeah, that, that's the challenge that we've got right now. There are essentially two different pools of accounts. Um, what this is essentially doing is creating a local account uh, behind the scenes in FileMaker, in, you know, in the schema of a database like you're used to. It ties it to the uh, email address you have associated with your uh, Claris ID, but it stores that actual password information in the file um, where the password that's in Claris ID is, is completely separate. Okay. This is, a, you know, something that, again, we, we we hope to have in here very shortly, just to kind of get out the door and have people start being able to test it and then validate that they're able to do, you know, a deployment that includes WebDirect as an example. Uh, but as we try to roll this out into real deployments, uh, the, the intent is that you'd have one single Claris ID or, again, logging with your ADFS or, or uh, you know, whatever auth makes sense for your business, um, and that that is universal across all parts of the application. Or platform, I should say. Got it. Thanks. Yep. Cool. Uh, so drilling in a little bit. Uh, actually, let me go back here for a moment. Um, when you first sign into Studio, uh, you will actually have these two views by default. Uh, just to give you kind of a, a place to start, kicking the tires, playing around with some sample data. Um, and I'll use this just to show some of the uh, enhancements that have come recently with the uh, spreadsheet view. Um, so we've had group and sort and filter for a while. We recently added the, the ability to color code these uh, rows. So, you know, maybe you're checking to see, I don't know, who's over a certain age. Um, let's say that the uh, age is greater than 10. Um, it adds that condition and then you can see automatically color codes uh, each of those records. Uh, we, what we've also done things like make it so that you can freeze columns. Uh, so now if I'm, you know, got a, a wide set of data here, I can freeze things that are important to me and, and still scroll around. Um, so this takes us, you know, more of the functionality that you would typically see in a spreadsheet uh, brought here uh, through Studio. And some of you may have seen, uh, again, giving you sort of a farther outlook. Um, one of the other things that we're working on for the platform is the idea that, okay, we've built all this great tech, this functionality in Studio and things like these um, spreadsheet views, but then being able to embed those views directly into your Claris Pro apps through a new object that we're working on that's sort of an evolution of a web viewer uh, where we can not only display that uh, spreadsheet, uh, but also pass it some CSS styling based on your theme or or you know, turn off certain elements of the UI that may not make sense for your use case. Um, I'm gonna be coming back to the spreadsheet a, a couple of times, but I wanna call out those couple areas that have been uh, updates uh, more recently. Then if I drill into um, the um, uh, sort of extension of the Claris Pro app that I showed you earlier. You remember we have registrations that are coming in and we facilitated that uh, through one of these data collection forms. Um, this is probably what you all have seen the most of, of, of from us uh, recently. This is what we started the platform with, um, but there's some key enhancements we've made over the last few months that I wanna make sure people are aware of. If we look at this form, I mean, actually maybe it'd be better if we actually start with the end state. Uh, so let's come into this particular form. Yeah, as I fill this out, uh, the first thing that I want to call out is uh, this dropdown. Because <clears throat> this dropdown is not um, a simple dropdown where I've hand uh, supply or manually supplied these two events. Uh, this is actually being driven, if I come back over to my views, um, we have these, this cool events table and it's pulling from these, these events. So we're actually creating sort of the first instances of like relationships in studio. So that as the users, I'm coming into the sign up and I'm picking which of these events or these, yeah, these events I'm signing up for. What happens then is as uh, the 
user submits this, uh, we will then capture the relevant record ID or, or identifier for the event. And that can even get then passed down into Pro. So if I come back into Pro for a moment and drill down under the, uh, under the hood, um, you'll see that I'm referencing the record ID. It's calling it out as the drop down here. Again, uh, this is a, a bug that we're working on so that you're getting the actual name of the field from Studio. But that drop down is pointing at the one that I just showed you uh, for cho choosing the event. So now I've got the record ID and now I can start building relationships on my uh, Pro side of the world based on data in Studio. Uh, then we've got some, you know, required fields. None of this is new, but uh, go ahead and uh, fill them out real quick. Um, what else do I need to fill? Okay, so down here, we'll, we'll, we'll skip these for now. Uh, it's not required, but um, the session is interesting because as I'm making choices, um, it's actually updating the UI around me. Um, so in this particular case, uh, if people are signing up for a Minux pizza party, uh, we want to sign off that, uh, you know, they're not going to sue us for heart attacks or something like that. So we've got a uh, sign up form here. And in here, I can come in and, and do a signature. And I'll show you in a moment how we can actually customize this similar to what we learned from uh, FileMaker Go and how that signature capture has been used over the years. Uh, likewise, just another example of that as people are coming in. Um, maybe they want to uh, donate. Uh, these events are really fundraisers at the end of the day for us. And so when someone goes and checks that, yeah, they wanna uh, donate, at that point, we can show the amount that they're donating. Uh, now, I wanted to call this out uh, because some of the things that we're playing with here is, you know, do we leave the, uh, the space for this and only show it or hide it? Or do we retake the space depending on uh, available real estate? Um, so just things that we're playing with right now. And then this last area is, oh, sorry, one other thing I should have called out. Um, th this field happened to be required, um, but we have built in logic such that if this was hidden and that field was empty, it would let me submit just fine, uh, but it knows that this field is being shown, so automatically enforces that uh, validation, um, which again, something that's doable in FileMaker today, uh, but we're trying to do a lot of that heavy lifting for you off uh, as you go. Uh, Ethan, I said there was a question here uh, around uh, the record ID. Is it just a UUID or is it an actual record ID under the hood? Uh, so right now it's an actual record, it's a number, it's not a UUID, it's an actual record ID. Uh, that's where we're starting from now. Uh, something that we're definitely collecting feedback on if that's the direction we wanna go long-term, but that's where we are at the moment. Uh, and Tom, thank you for the, the votes here on, on fields not jumping around. Um, the the, the ultimate solution may end up needing to be some options here on which one it does, but we're starting to try to figure out what, what is for the up the middle case that we can default to. Um, and then Ethan, the questions about record ID. Um, you know what? I don't know the answer to the clone. I wouldn't expect it to because that data is really coming from uh, Pro. Um, okay. I'm going to move on because I see there's a lot coming in, but I'll try to get back to these questions as they're coming. Uh, but just to call out another example of uh, dynamically changing these uh, forms as you go based on user's input, uh, we also have this option for free swag here. And um, I want you to pay attention to the submit button because as I check this, uh, we automatically change that from submit to next because what we've done here is uh, added a condition that uh, if the customer or the user signing up does want some free swag that we're going to show them an additional page where they can go in and specify their uh, shirt size and, and address for it to be sent to them uh, before then ultimately taking them to the confirmation page. Um, so I want to I wanted to give you sort of the end results, uh, but let's take a look at how we're doing a couple of those things. So we drill back down into the view and into the event sign up. Um, you'll notice here we've added this new uh, button here that will bring up the jump to page dialogue. And you could just set very straightforward, you know, basically if this, then go do that kind of setup here. Uh, right now, this is all handled um, by UI drop, you know, drop down, click, pick, making choices that way. Um, but, and we'll go into this more detail at the webinar in a couple of weeks. Uh, what this is actually doing behind the scenes is generating some low code um, uh, language for us so that then you'd be able to go in and start layering on additional customizations. But we're starting from a point of making it really easy to solve these kinds of use cases with just a couple of clicks um, and then allowing you to focus your efforts on extending that. 
This uh, option is also associated with each of the buttons. Um, you can do some pretty wild things. I think we're a little too broad right now as far as, you know, the crazy logic that you can have as far as where pages route to and you can create some loops there um, that probably wouldn't be great user experiences uh, for your end users. So we're learning rapidly on, on what works here and, and you'll see that interface um, uh, mature as we're getting feedback from the community. Um, and then for showing or hiding these uh, images or these, uh, sorry, the um, different objects on the page, uh, we've got our first sort of action uh, action engine, sort of um, like an evolution of our scripting engine. Uh, but it's very similar to what I just showed you on the jump to page. We're using the same kind of logic, point and click, make some choices and drop downs, uh, and then behind the scenes um, generating uh, some low code that you would then be able to extend. Um, again, that's not in this build, but you'll see a preview of it uh, in a couple of weeks at the webinar. Um, and then the drill down real quick on the signature, uh, much like we, we have in Pro Today, uh, you have different inline options and then the ability to actually pop it up in a modal, which is what you saw me do there as well. Uh, but again, we'll continue to refine that. Uh, what we're working on now is getting those signature, that signature, uh, not just the end result, but actually the ability to capture signature built right into Pro leveraging the same UI. Uh, so you'll be seeing that coming uh, again in the not too distant future. Uh, before I move on to some other view types, any thoughts uh, or questions around the data collection? Anything here that you see as a big gap missing that would prevent you uh, from using something like this as opposed to maybe a Google Forms or Jot Forms that you may be using today? Cost not, and licensing. Please, uh, yep, go ahead. Cost and licensing questions about that mm -hmm. one, the big hindrance. You, you're, you're talking about costs and licensing more broadly of the Claris platform. It, it was that the question? Yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah, I, I don't have specifics to announce uh, at the moment uh, around that, that that'll be uh, coming soon other than our options of the Claris platform bundle today um, that you have access to. Uh, but one thing that we want to uh, be, be clear on, especially around this external data collection forms, like our goal there is to not put artificial bounds on how many records or how many users are coming through there. We really want that to be as unbound as possible. Um, what you'll see as we start rolling out free tier, as an example, uh, you'll be limited by number of users that are in studio using these views and building you know, apps in pro and accessing apps in pro. Um, but the data collection piece of it, of these forms, there won't be those same times of limitations. Uh, there will be a Claris, you know, powered by Claris banner at the bottom in the free tier um, that can be then removed when you go to the, one of the bundles. Um, but the idea there is to, to really make it much easier for you to reach out into the world and collect data like you do through other inter integrations through you know, web services and things like that. Um, you see that there's a huge gap in the platform's current ability to reach out to your customers' customers. Um, the first step of that is be able to collect data from them. The next step after that will be then expanding it so that you can start publishing aspects of this to those anonymous users. You may hear this called a customer portal as an example. I think that's what Microsoft calls it or the Power Apps portal or something to that effect, uh, where you could do things like, you know, I've got um, coming back to this events, you know, maybe you have it published so other people can come in and uh, make changes to those events after they initially submitted them. Or maybe you've got a customer uh, customer success uh, ticketing system where someone's called in and, and you've done a support call with them and they want to be able to come in, identify themselves in some way, but not log into a Claris ID and be able to pull that data up. Um, or uh, you'll see dashboards here in a little bit. I, and I imagine that'll probably be one of the first areas we try to tackle where, hey, I just want to be able to publish insights. Uh, maybe the results of my event, I publish those up as, as a dashboard for anonymous folks to come in and, and look at. Can I can I follow up real quick with that? So you mentioned Absolutely. the customer. Thank you. The customer portals uh, feature is mm -hmm. super exciting for our business. Um, do you have any idea if that will be? I don't even know how to ask it exactly, but like uh, if licensing costs would be based on number of customers accessing a portal, or because that's always been the problem with FileMaker for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I don't have the specifics. I will tell you though, like. <clears throat> We see a lot of that need today. And what ends up happening is you're either going completely 
custom development yourself and then trying to integrate it with Pro uh, with the, your, your solution, or you're trying to take WebDirect and stretch it both from a Tech, uh, technology-wise uh, standpoint, you know, it's, it's really not built to scale that way. And you're pushing it from a, a licensing, like that wasn't how we envisioned WebDirect being used. And so we recognize that gap. Um, and so I, again, I don't know the specifics of how the licensing will work, um, but I wouldn't compare it to how we've done licensing in the past with things like WebDirect, because we recognize the differences in, in the approach and the, the type of problem that they're trying to solve. Um, so understand that that'll be top of mind to make sure that does us no good if we build something really powerful, but then we don't license it in a way that you can leverage. Um, so th that's the best update I can give you at the moment. Um, okay, I, I just Robert? another question. Yep. Oh Before. yeah, I did. Yeah, hi, uh, Benedict here. Uh, a question for you, and if you already covered it, I missed it. Uh, I had a use case last year for a sort of anonymous, semi-anonymous login so that it was sensitive data they had to fill in. So we'd send them like a, uh, a token, a link with a token, basically. Mm -hmm. And then they could log in. That link would basically expire within 24 hours and they could refresh mm -hmm. it and get sent another email and stuff. So that, that was a sort of semi-anonymous use case. Do you have a, like, is there a way of doing that? You know, send a sort of token or a link with a token to a specific. So it's a single use token login. Mm -hmm. Yep, to totally understand uh, the ask. We don't have that today. Um, so if we share one of these views today, uh, da, 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 what am I looking at here? Oh, back over here. Um, sorry, it's kind of a wish list item. item. <laughs> so yeah, no, totally. Um, and, and, you know, and uh, something that we're building towards right now. It's just this single link. Uh, there is the ability to turn this link on or off. So you might put something up for some period of time, then close registrations. Uh, and then maybe open them up as needed. Uh, but what our one of our next steps there is then to be able to um, go that sort of next level where you're saying, okay, I mentioned earlier sort of identifying, the customer can identify themselves some way. That might be that they log in with some account or it might be what you just described where, hey, each individual person gets their own unique ID or um, a URL with an ID attached to it. And that's how you track their access. So not there yet, but totally understand the uh, the need for it. Yeah, it was, I set it up, it worked. It was a good way of doing it. You know, with these links mm -hmm. that expire after time that you set, 24 hours, yep. whatever. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and then run, what, real quick, one last question here, and then I'll move on uh, from Ethan around, are, are images able to be uploaded and transferred into Pro? Um, so we do, uh, oops, sorry, I need to do that again. Uh, we do have the capability of you um, uploading an image. Uh, so if I go into these add object, there is a uh, attachment uh, file type, and that will allow you to upload image or really any other file type. Uh, there is a size limit, which I'm, I'm, is escaping my mind at the moment, uh, but you can upload it, it gets stored in studio. Uh, what we are actively working on right now, though, is then being able to take that container data and make that available in Pro. Um, there, there, there's a lot in the container functionality on the Pro side uh, that we've don't have yet on the studio side. And there's not a clear indication that 100% of what's on the pro side needs to be in the studio side. So we're working through making sure that those two things line up. But entire, the, the intent entirely is that you'd be able to use a web form like this, collect whether it's signatures or again, container data, like you know they're submitting their ID, have that then be uploaded to studio and then have access to it in pro. So maybe there's someone that's going through and making sure that everyone uploaded a, a valid ID. Um, that, that is something that we're working on. Alrighty, uh, so coming back to the views, we've, we've talked about uh, this form and the registration data, but now I wanna start getting into extending some of those bits of functionality we saw on the pro side. And we'll, we'll start actually, I'm gonna do a little out of order, but with this to-do list. Um, so we started off with just a spreadsheet, um, a spreadsheet view. So this has all the same data. In fact, it is the data that you're seeing on the pro side. Currently I've got it grouped based off of the different events. Of course I could filter it and do things of that nature. Um, but I think handling uh, to do would be much easier through a Kanban board. So if I go in here for any of these views, uh, you'll have options to, to create um, different views from them. So think of the spreadsheet as sort of your your home base, that's that's sort of a, the closest representation of the entity itself. Um, and then I can start stacking views on top of that. So we'll, we'll do a Kanban here. 
Um, this might look a little different than what you may have seen in the last demo. Uh, we've been making some enhancements to this creation process. Uh, but from here, you'll be able to choose a data source. We'll, we'll leave it to that to-do that we just chose from. Um, you'll then choose sort of your swim lanes. Uh, we've already got a status field in there, so that's great. I don't need to create anything more. Um, and then you've got some sort of out-of-the-box options on what we display uh, for each of these cards. So if I go in and create the board, uh, you can see that it automatically moved over all of my to-do items. Again, I can filter this, so maybe I don't want all of my to-dos, but to a specific event. So uh, let's say everything for Rise to Awesome. Uh, and then you can see all of my cards there. You can customize these swim lanes, so you can add additional lanes. You could hide things like the not categorized. Uh, and then you can actually customize the uh, cards as well. Um, actually, let's turn, let's go to the other event. Um, because I also wanted to show how dynamic these individual cards are. So you can see here, we've got one that includes an image. We automatically shows that we automatically show that and uh, resize as appropriately or as needed. But then you can go in and show and hide these different elements and point them to different fields as you want. What's again, really exciting. I, I probably keep coming back to this. We talked earlier about that spreadsheet view and potentially embedding that into Pro. Um, I'm really excited about the concept of being able to do this, this kind of thing as these kinds of views as well. Uh, I know that we've got add-ons and we've seen some incredible things that are built in the community, which I don't see going away because there's an, it's some really incredible sort of customization that's been layered on, um, which is part of the beauty of this platform because you can start off as simple as this sort of out of the box functionality and then really go all in on JavaScript and tight web, uh, uh, web viewer integration if you choose to. But you know, as you're starting off, and I think Andy touched on this last week, and you're talking to potential clients, and they're giving you examples of, of requirements that you or that they have, um, instead of having to cobble together some previous um, uh, project or some, build something from scratch just enough to as a proof of concept, you'll be able to start leveraging these views that get right out of the box of Studio to show, like, yeah, this platform is capable of it. Um, and then if you do need to make some high level customization, um, you have those uh, web viewer and JavaScript routes as needed. Um, we'll also talk about this a little bit more detail uh, in a couple of weeks, but you know, where we're heading with these different view types is we wanna give you these things sort of out of the box, get you started, make it really easy to cover for most of the use cases. Uh, but our eventual plan is to start opening it up so you can, you all as developers can start creating your own views in Studio, your own custom views. Um, and I think that's where things are going to get really interesting, especially as you start exchanging them and sharing them amongst the community. Uh, moving on for view types, but if there's any questions on, oh, it looks like there was a couple, oh, maybe not. Okay, if there's any questions on Kanban that I can answer as I'm going to the next section, feel free to unmute. Um, I want to come back to Pro for a moment here. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the to-do, but the other is the purchase requests. Um, and what we're thinking here is where cases where you may have someone that is just approving those requests. So they may not live in your Claris Pro world or your Claris Pro solution. They really don't have any other aspects of it that they need, but they are responsible for approving requests um, or purchase requests. So that's where, again, you can start building a view on top of Studio and make that much easier to share with that individual. So here I've got my purchase request table um, and we'll go in here and do a new list detail view. Um, so this one has been around for a little while. We, we introduced this in the summer and we've made some iterations on it, uh, not as much as the Kanban. Uh, but what this allows you to do uh, is create a very common paradigm, which you've all seen. Of, you've got your list of records on the left and clicking on one gives you uh, the details of it. Much like the Kanban board, we can come in here and customize, uh, oh, that's on the side, customize the individual cards. Uh, so showing and hiding different fields, depending on you know, what makes sense for what you're tracking. And then just like the uh, form view uh, that we showed earlier, uh, this is uh, customizable for the objects that you have on here. So I can go in and add additional objects or, or move objects around. We'll move our event here to the top as an example, why they're uh, asking for it, and then have the approver and the status of it here. And if I go in and preview this, um, we'll see one also cool thing about it, which is, um, this is also dynamic. So as I'm going to different uh, device sizes, uh, we will automatically resize. And not just going from making the two columns smaller, but if you go all the way down to a mobile, um, actually creating for you automatically two different pages. So if I add a new record here, you can see it automatically takes me to that detail and then lets me then back out uh, to that list. 
Um, and if I have multiple records, it automatically gives you some navigation. Uh, so this is super handy just so that you can uh, you know, create a review for processing records or sort of catalog of records um, and make it really efficient for people to, to scroll through and, and make changes. Any questions on that one? Cool. Um, the last uh, thing that you may have seen before, before we get into some of the peaks into some new stuff coming, um, we'll come back to a spreadsheet view because it's around being able to create uh, dashboards. I, I mentioned earlier um, something that we recognize as a strength of the platform today, and we've seen lots of really great examples of using file your FileMaker solution as sort of a hub for the business where you've got integrations through, you know, web services or through, you know, ODBC connections, and you're using server-side scripting to pull in a bunch of data, process it, sort of prepare it for reports. Um, but then from there, um, we recognize our charting engine pro uh, leaves some room for desire. Um, we recognize that taking those kinds of reports and getting them to maybe um, exec level folks within an organization is difficult because they really want to be able to just pull up you know, uh, a web page on their phone and quick get quick insights. Um, so you often have to turn to some th third parties like Tableau and and other charting or, or sort of uh, visualization tools. Um, and so you're going to start seeing more of that uh, capability built into Studio. Now we're not going after trying to compete with Tableau head to head. There are tons of value that Tableau and, and incredible things that they built makes sense. Um, but for cases where you're just trying to get insights and surface them within your organization. Uh, there's quite a bit here uh, from a charting perspective that uh, we think has value. Um, here we, we've got a spreadsheet. This data would have come from um, a couple of sources. Uh, part of the data is just the data of people submitting things. So you, you, you understand who they are, what event and sessions that they signed up for. Um, but we had also would send out a sort of follow up to the event to these people and get, you know, what are your final donation amounts and the actual donation that you donation that you submitted. Um, and maybe we're pulling that data from a third party system. Uh, and then they're also submitting sort of what their feedback on the event was. And we're running that through a, a web service that'll give us feedback on sort of what they're feeling. So a sentiment detector, okay. And we pull that all into this table. From here, I can now start doing some charting and get a kind of high level, um, you know, what are people looking at or, or how are people feeling rather? Do we have, looks like we've got a lot of people that are happy versus ecstatic and we can look at this and preview it in different views. Um, some things that are have just recently released uh, are these new chart types. So bubble chart and the combo chart, which is pretty cool because now I can come in here and say, okay, well, that's how people are feeling, but you know, is there any correlation with an update, uh, the donation amount? Uh, well, we can see here that, man, the people that are excited are, are donating the most and people that are disappointed are not donating that much pretty obvious, but you're going to imagine how uh, some of your data sets, this would be super useful um, to be able to compare on. And you'll see me do this uh, charting sort of ad hoc at the spreadsheet level. Um, and that's great for just getting quick insights. But then if I want to up level that, I can go and create a dashboard out of this. And we'll create a new dashboard view for you automatically and, and place that chart. And then from here, you can start adding additional chart types. So you know, maybe we add another bar chart and we make it about... Um, Actually, let's do a pie chart and we make it about the, uh, let's see, oh, no, that's the right thing, not first name. Let's go to um, the session that they attended. Um, and now we can see here that uh, Minook's Pizza Party had the bulk of it. Uh, not very many people are interested in, in Brad's karaoke. All right, so we get those quick insights, but then we can go further and take it uh, so that maybe we want to see. Um, a spreadsheet view of the data, but not all of the data. I can come in here and start filtering this so that um, I'm seeing not all the records, but uh, donation amounts greater than, I don't know, I look at the amounts, we'll see what that gives us. Okay, only two people donated more than a thousand, but you get the idea. We can surface maybe the top 10 donators here. And then one last thing I want to show, there's, there's quite a bit here that, that we can dig into in more detail if necessary, but uh, I did want to also show this quick filter option, because what this gives you the ability to do is um, apply filters across either all of the charts or charts that you specifically choose to filter data. So let's go in here and add a quick filter for um, a Nooks Pizza Party as an example, and we will filter that 
so that the session uh, is equal to the party. Uh, and now when I add that, I have this button that when clicked will filter that data just to that particular event. And you know, you could add for each of these or whatever dimensions you want to filter this based off of. Uh, but again, you don't have to do it apply to everything on the page. Uh, so it really doesn't make sense for me to filter this session. So I can come in here and this one, uncheck that. You can see now these are updated as appropriately based on that filter, uh, but this one stays the same. I got to say, I'm I as someone that has built a number of solutions uh, internally for Claris um, that's collected data from different areas, being able to now start up, up leveling this through dashboards like this that I can share with the brands of the world, something that has me really excited. Um, we talked um, earlier about sort of the growth of the use cases and starting with data collection and that, that I think does have tons of value, but starting to then up level this kind of visibility into your data within, or, within an organization, um, I think opens up lots of new possibilities for us and being able to do it much simpler than having to go through a third party or, or try to build something yourself using JavaScript libraries as an example. So I'll pause there again. Any, any specific questions around dashboarding? Okay, well, then I want to give you a preview of a couple of additional views that are not out yet, uh, but ones that we're working on. Um, this one, styling wise, I'm in dark mode, isn't perfect yet. Uh, but what this allows you to do is start um, laying out timelines. Um, so in here, I can dynamically oops, uh, resize these as necessary. I can move them around uh, up this one. And you can see here, let me actually, oops, zoom out a little bit here. Uh, you can see that what we have is these are grouped by the event, and so we can see the full length of the event, and that automatically changes based off of the children underneath of it. Uh, you can then split this by day, uh, the other way, I guess week, month, quarter, and so you can really get a high level view of maybe an event that you're planning out or projects that you're managing. And then another view that we're very early on to, though, is a gallery view. Um, this is something that I, I've seen built tons of times in FileMaker. Uh, I've built it myself, but something that we can give you right out of the box. And this is still being fine-tuned, so the spacing and how everything looks exactly is still being worked on. Uh, but just to give you an idea of where we're heading with these types of views, and like any of the other ones, we can bring on up more detail, we can add additional fields. Um, customization is pretty light on this one right now as far as showing the media, the title, uh, but as you added additional fields, those would show up there. Um, and then filter sort and color coding them as well. And again, I'll tie this all back to, these are really powerful views to have, web-based, super easy to share, again, with people sort of outside of the normal circle that may have had FileMaker Pro running. Um, but the goal as we, as we continue to build this out is then to be able to leverage these views, not just through the web and for those folks, but then more tightly integrated inside of your Claris Pro apps for all the users that are, are that that is where they live and that's where their um, uh, you know, pri primary workflow takes them. So that was my core tour. Um, I have what, about 10 minutes, I think, Jonathan, for any questions, um, um, I can open it up. Thank you, Robert. That was great. It's exciting to see how things are evolving and changing uh, so quickly. Um, any questions for Robert? Uh, I have one. I guess it was a little confused on the dashboard. You were customizing your filters. Was that creating a button for the end user to use, or do they have do they have the capability of accessing some of these filtering things um, without you building it first? Yep, beautiful question. Um, so in the in the example I gave, um, so we're in preview mode now here. Um, uh, it is creating a button essentially for the end user. And if I had created you know multiples here, you would see them in a line, and clicking on any one of them would filter. If you wanted to have the user be able to find filters, you can absolutely do that as well. We have this uh, filter option, um, and then this becomes a tool for them to then drill down and and to find filters. Cool. Very cool. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Robert, I had a question about the accounts. Uh, mm -hmm. When you uh, indicated if an extended account in the password, would, and that connects to the pro account, right? You said? 
It, it connects to a local account, but only WebDirect, Data API, and server-side scripting leverage it. So when you're setting up a server-side script and it asks for a, an account to run on that behalf, that's where you would use the extended account. But when you're logging in through Pro or Go, um, you would log in with your Claris ID at launch of the of the app of the pro application and then we could then automatically log you into any application any claris pro app that you or, yeah claris pro solution that you have created uh, automatically all right so basically claris id is going to be the key to opening up a profile does that mean that if you have a multi-file solution you have to put that claris id in every single file uh, it does mean that the Claris ID needs to be in every single file, um, but our ability, um, making it so that you manually have to do it is what we're trying to avoid. So what you might in the very beginning of this, yes, you're going to need to go and add your Claris ID to each of those files. Um, when you convert the file, we automatically add your Claris ID as the admin to each of those files. Uh, but figuring out ways that we can um, migrate existing solutions accounts to the new world with Claris ID is something that we're working on. There is a challenge with local accounts specifically, though, because we don't know who like that the, a local account doesn't tie to a person. We don't know who they are, or how to send them an, an email invite to a Claris ID as an example. Um, where you're using Active Directory and, and other um, uh, external authentication, that should be much easier for us, uh, but something that we're looking at. All right, I'll look forward that, to finding out the exciting uh, developments in this area. This is a big uh, point. Uh, uh, obviously, you know that. Oh, absolutely. We're, we're, to be very clear, we are very early on as far as um, the authentication method in. Again, Claris ID is just where we're starting, uh, but that is not at all the end of this journey. Um, and we also don't have all the permissions and roles, uh, you know, locked down yet either, right? So you, right now you've got essentially two roles. You're either a team manager, which gives you full keys to the kingdom, or you're a member and you're only able to, um, I should have mentioned this earlier, if you're a member, the only thing you see when you log in is this hubs page. So you have none of this UI on the left-hand side, so you have no way of customization. Um, you're gonna start seeing um, more finer controls over you know, what level of data you have, your access to the data itself you have per view. Um, you'll have more control over the data in Studio versus Pro and who has access to it, uh, as well as additional view types. Like we want to get to a place where you could start inviting non-developers or, you know, team leads that are subject matter experts into their own little sandbox, right? So that they're sort of isolated, but they can start using Studio to start creating their, you know, solving the problems that they have in front of us. Um, and then you as developers could then pick that up as necessary, be able to integrate all of that data. So there's a lot more that we have planned for not just the authentication, but the roles and permissions. Um, we're, we're still very early on on that. All right, thanks. Yeah, of course, Alan. Robert, I have a question. Um, sure. You had the page where you showed, you chose events and you had the drop down you showed us, and then there were sessions down below. Mm -hmm. Are the yep. sessions, the values in that session dropdown changed based on the event that you choose? Um, in this case, uh, not yet. Um, uh, so we're still working on um, sort of conditional value list, con conditional situations like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we're not fully there yet. Uh, right now, based on the event, I'm, I, I've got hand-coded uh, sessions, um, but we're very close to that being capable. Um, and that again is the intent is that, you know, we give you um, sort of out of the box, those kinds of controls, you know, doing conditional value lists in pro today is not the easiest thing. You, you know, you've got relationship paths, you've got scripting ways that you can do it, uh, but ways that we can um, automate that for you as much as we can. Um, so stand to look out for that. We understand that as part of the use case, because of course, in this example, the different events would likely have different sessions associated with them. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Robert, a <clears throat> uh, yep, yep. couple of questions. One is, uh, you mentioned something about the evolution of the web viewer. Does that pertain just to Claris Studio or will that affect um, FileMaker and Claris, FileMaker Pro and Claris Pro? Um, and let me break that down a couple of ways. Uh, so the, 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 the object that we're talking about right now that we're working on, and it's still very early on to be clear, um, what, uh, would use the same underlying technology as a web viewer in that it's 
rendering a web page. And some of you may have seen a demo I did over the summer where I literally just took a URL from a, a view in Studio and pasted it into a web viewer just as sort of a, hey, look, that's kind of cool. I have a spreadsheet embedded into Pro. Um, <clears throat> but with this new object, it's really going to be more tied to specifically Studio and to its views. Um, and so that by that nature would mean that it's in Claris Pro and not um, the sort of FileMaker platform. Okay. I don't okay. want to rule out, though, that we may learn things in that process that we might want to bring, you know, some enhancements we need to better integrate with, with Clara Studio. Maybe there's some things there that we would want to do on the sort of, uh, I don't want to say generic web viewer object, but maybe it's that web viewer object. Still too early to know for sure. Um, I would encourage you if, if you guys, I saw a couple people excited about the idea of advancing uh, web viewers. Um, so if you've got ideas around that and why you would want that, please let us know. So we're, as we're thinking about that, uh, we're keeping those things top of mind. Okay. And then one, one other follow-up question is when you do the aggregation, so like if you're in a chart and mm -hmm. uh, you're looking at the, you're, you're, a, you're a member and you're looking at a hub and you have a chart in view, if people are submitting, does that chart update in the real time? Like as oh, people beautiful submit? question. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you asked that. I'm, I forgot to mention that earlier. So in the in the product right now, the answer is no. Uh, but another one of the things that we're working on is sort of cross-platform notifications. Uh, and by notifications, I don't mean customer-facing notifications. I mean the product, the products talking to each other. Um, and so right now, um, if I were to update records, for instance, in my spreadsheet and then look in Pro, they wouldn't automatically update. I'd have to do a refresh window and vice versa between Pro and Studio and even between Studio views, right? Um, so we're not there yet, uh, but that's where we're heading uh, with some of the underlying foundational pieces that we're building such that, you know, as you're making changes, uh, maybe you're updating data, pushing new updates from, uh, uh, from data that's being pulled through Pro, push that studio view that you could do it in a more live fashion, but not where we sit right this moment in time. Okay, thank you so much, Robert. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> cool. Um, I have a question okay. for you. Yep, sure. On uh, Claris ID, I've had mm -hmm. over the last several months, I've had several problems with Claris ID. Um, I have two databases, two customers that I uh, that are on Claris Cloud, and um, uh, and you know I'm not otherwise normally, and so it'll be maybe a month or two in between uh, times when I have to log into one of those to make a change to their database, mm -hmm. and uh, on about four occasions now, um, it's come up user disabled and when i talk to tech support they have to um uh you know put that up to about the third level support and it takes uh between a day and three days for them to resolve it and then they say okay you're good now and of course my customer who wanted a change on their database is right. going crazy because i'm not giving them good service and it's really aggravating and I keep telling them each time it happens, I say, okay, whatever you had to do, can you put it in the notes so that, you know, we don't have to wait three days next time. And uh, it's, you know, each time they say, oh, this should never happen again. And it does. Right. What's up with that? I mean, I, I share your frustration I, I, and I'm asking this not to be dismissive, but when was the last time this happened? Because I, I thought we had tamped this issue down. Um, is this something you've recently run into? It's probably been, I don't know, three or four weeks, maybe. Oh, okay. Well, that's but, that's sooner than I would have thought. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Ken, can, uh, let, let's follow up. I want to dig into this a little bit more. I'm curious on the call, has anyone else run into this with Claris ID? Okay. If you... Um, if anyone else runs into this, please do reach out. But Ken, um, uh, do you have my contact? It's just Robert underscore Holsey at Claris.com. Um, if you could reach out to me, um, let, I, I'll get some people on our side connected and we'll try to get to the bottom of what's going on there. Okay, sounds good. I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, no problems. And again, I, uh, they're frustrating for us as well. And you said it was uh, Robert S. Halsley? Uh, underscore uh, I can put it, I'll put it in chat just to make it easy for everyone. Okay, sounds good. 
Thank you. Yep. Um, just as a heads up uh, for anyone that emails me, I will be out next week, uh, but uh, I'll get this routed, uh, Ken, as soon as I get back. All right, I, have thank a, you. I have a quick question for you. Sure. Uh, real Is, quick, I, I think we were supposed to stop at one. I, I'm okay to keep going for a bit longer, but just to be sensitive folks' times, Jonathan. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, no, we can we can let it run for a couple more minutes. Cool. Cool. Sorry about that. Yeah, want, go ahead. I just want to know if Studio was based on MongoDB's Atlas product. Oh, yeah, I was just about to respond to that. Um, so no, I'm curious why you're why you're asking that though. Um, what, what about Atlas would be interesting to you? Well, it, it's actually, they look very similar. Uh, it's mm -hmm. the same type of shell. It's view oriented. Um, they have hubs. They, um, um, it looks, it looks like a very similar product. Got it. Got it. So, uh, no, we're not, we're not using anything from Atlas. Um, it's come up, you know, I, I know people have looked at it on the engineering side, um, but nothing beyond that. Okay, so it is a complete, so Mongo didn't uh, like do anything to make this possible. You're doing it all on your own. Correct. And, and as I mentioned earlier, Mongo is, you know, the choice we made based off of the information in front of us and what we think we thought would be the best starting point, but we're really building Studio to be agnostic. Um, so if we ever did choose that we wanted to change from Mongo in the future, or again, we wanted to open it up so you all could link to some other backend, uh, we we want to get there. We're not there yet, but um, that's how we're thinking about it as we're building this platform. Well, I'll say I'm a big fan of Mongo. If it were actually possible to change backends and use Dynamo, for example, if a customer were already using it, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I, I think Mongo is a great choice myself. Cool. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks for your questions. All right, last call for questions. Sounds like- Yes. Oh, I, all right, last one, better day. I, I know this is the Southern Californian meeting, but when can I get uh, Claris ID, uh, Claris Studio in Germany? Is there any <laughs> kind of timeline? <laughs> I, I don't want to speak to a specific timeline. Um, we're doing everything that we can to make sure that we can stand up uh, data centers around the world, make sure that we are you know, GDPR compliant and that you know, we, we are uh, able to roll it out to the folks that are very eager in Germany and, and, and Europe and, and uh, Japan to get access to it. Um, I don't have an exact timeline at the moment, but we're talking you know, months, not, not a year. Um, and so as more, we have more information on it, we will, we'll be communicating that widely. Thank you. I'm very excited that you're excited for it though. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. It'll, it'll be good. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> David, I, I, I like Mongo. I think that is uh, way more fun to say than Draco. I don't know about way more fun, but it is more fun. Um, <laughs> I put my email address in there. Um, there is a product email address and Jonathan, maybe I can get that out to you because um, I don't remember it off the top of my head. I wanna make sure I get it typed correctly. So if there is additional follow-up questions, that's actually a better place because that goes to the entire product team, not just to me. And again, I'm out next week, uh, but Jonathan, I'll be in touch with you. And if you can share that out, uh, that'd be great with folks. Absolutely. All right, well, thank you, Robert, for uh, coming and sharing uh, time with us. And uh, thank you to Vince for the presentation earlier. And I think that's a wrap for this month's meeting. We'll be back um, second, second Friday of the month as always in February. And uh, Dave, that's your meeting, I believe. Yeah, so anybody, anybody has something cool to share, show, et cetera, please knock on my door. Sounds good. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you all. Thanks Bye. a lot, JR.